30 years. Wow. Looking back, I think uh, you can be very proud of what you have achieved. You have uh, served very well the gas industry, the business uh, over the last 30 years. In the last 30 years, you have been shaping the energy discussions in Brussels, in Europe and beyond. Thank you for the help, technical help you give to me and my colleagues in the EDP group. 30 years of achievements, long way, with definitely well recognized results. The next 30 years will be critical in delivering carbon neutrality. If Eurogas wants to be part of the future, Eurogas will have to transform very quickly. My main message to Eurogas is to contribute to decarbonization. Eurogas can help the green transformation of Europe. Switching from coal to gas in the power sector is the easiest way to reduce emissions at scale in the short term. We in the Environmental Defence Fund um, remain open to keep the conversation with Eurogas and its members. The IA is ready to work with Eurogas. Let's find sustainable solutions together in good and frank social dialogue. Regulators look forward to working with those in the gas industry towards achieving a carbon neutral EU in 2050. We look forward to working with you in the next 30 years and to celebrating the 60th anniversary in 2050. Please continue to be professional, innovative and open. Therefore, I wish you a very bright and very green future. Here's the next 30 years and happy birthday. So thank you for the nice cooperation and to wish you a happy anniversary. Congratulations with the 30 year anniversary. Happy anniversary. We are very proud of you, Eurogas. Congratulations again and have a great celebration. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Commissioner, MEPs, regulators. It's great to have so many of you with us here today for Eurogas's annual conference, where we will indeed be looking at whether or not we have a single pathway to 2050, or if there are different opportunities for us as we pursue the energy transition in Europe. Indeed, we've got a lot of very important people here today who are going to be giving some great insight into what's going on. You've seen some of them wishing us our very best for our 30th anniversary. And what a poignant time to be having our 30th anniversary in 2020 with so much to play for for the next 30 years. And I'm sure with all the different people that we have discussing this great opportunity for Europe, we'll find lots of insights into what we can expect to happen in the energy transition in the next 30 years. We do have to do one very important thing, though, before we do start uh, with the show, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we must recall uh, the recent passing of our former president, Klaus Schaefer. He was truly a great man. He really did live to the great principles that he had. And he really did influence so many of us in a very positive way. He gave so much to Eurogas and he gave so much to Uniper. He was well loved and well respected across the industry, across the world, across the policymakers. Everybody who met him was touched by his humanity. Uh, he's gone way too soon uh, for our liking. And really, we would like to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to also uh, contribute to the charities that he identified that he would like people to support uh, at, at this present time. And so please do contact me or any members of the Eurogas team, and we'll be happy to help you donate to those charities that are being dedicated to fighting cancer and children's cancer in particular. But ladies and gentlemen, just join me for a couple of moments to just uh, think about Klaus and think about all he's done and how much we all miss him uh, here in Eurogas. And so on that sad note, we have to move on to the next part of the show and think about what the future is and what the future means and what the future is that people like Klaus would have wanted to see. The role of gas in defining what we will achieve in terms of carbon neutrality and climate neutrality by 2050. And these are the themes that we'll be looking at today. And I'm very, very happy to say that we have great keynote speakers who will be entertaining you for the next hour. And then we will go into moderated sessions where we have lots of people from across the electricity sector, from the gas infrastructure sector, industry, consumers, regulators, all with their own ideas about how we get to 2050. But let us start with Eurogas's ideas. Let us start with how Eurogas has a vision for 2050 and how we will get there. 
And so I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker, who is the president of Eurogas and also the president of Total for gas, renewables and power. So if you want to know anything about energy system integration, this is a great man to learn from. Uh, please welcome Philippe Sorquet, the president of Eurogas, for the opening welcome speech. Philippe, the floor is yours. Thank you, James, and uh, good afternoon and welcome to, to all of you. Uh, be assured that uh, we are very pleased that you could join us today, uh, even, uh, uh, even uh, if I would have preferred uh, to, uh, uh, us to be all uh, in the same room to interact uh, this afternoon. Uh, but clearly we are living interesting times. We are standing at a unique crossroads uh, and we can look back over 30 years of achievement in the European gas industry while at the same time look forward to another 30 years of innovation and, uh, and progress. Uh, the gas industry can be rightly proud of the role that it has played in the European energy system over the past 30 years, delivering vast carbon reduction, affordable heating, system security, competitive European industry, and so much more. And the next 30 years promise to be even more exciting and full of opportunities for the European energy sector and the gas sector in particular. Today's conference is all about the path that lies ahead of us and the route we should take to achieve our climate objective in a cost-effective way. As we make the choice of how to go forward to achieve the climate neutrality in Europe, Eurogas has contributed its own vision of the pathway to the 2050. We developed a study with the NVGL to see how we could deliver the climate ambition of Europe. And our pathways deliver, of course, climate neutrality, but in a cost-effective way, using the principle of energy efficiency, the renewables and the low-carbon electricity, but also important volumes of gaseous fuels. European Eurogas pathway, when compared to the European Commission's own long-term strategy forecast, can clearly deliver the same climate neutrality, but save over some 130 billion euros per year and 4 trillion euros by 2050. 4 trillion euros is a lot of money and probably hard for all of you, including me, to imagine. So let me help you. The German economy output was in 2019 estimated to be at about this amount, 3.85 trillion euros. So our pathway, our Eurogas pathway, set the economic output of the German economy in one year. And we all know how much our industry is, 85 million German friends like to work. Our pathway is also built without prejudice. Prejudice is often the reason why some models develop strange sentiment, for instance, like electrifying heat. The European Commission foresees a decline of gaseous fuels in heating in Europe by 2050, and conversely, uh, a need for an enormous rate of electrification of heat in its 1.5 tech scenario. We estimate that the electrification of heat in this scenario will cost more than 12 trillion euros in subsidies alone. And so now that we all know that uh, uh, what 4 trillion euros look like, that means more than three years economic output from Germany. And that's only just, just uh, the subsidies. So I think we are safe to agree that this is a lot of money. And we can say that using gaseous, renewable and decarbonized fuel, we can save that money at least more than 10 trillion of it. So we must reject energy prejudice and instead bring forward the most promising technology here in Europe to deliver the challenge of the climate. We need a level playing field for gaseous fuels and we must not chase unicorn like electrifying all heat that in the end could result in our failure to do so and thus also fail to deliver on the premise of climate neutrality. But we have good news. Last year, Eurogas conducted a poll across the European Union and found that in countries like Germany and, and the Netherlands, more than 50% of respondents are already willing to eat their homes with biomethane or hydrogen. And this was before the hydrogen uh, strategy of any country that had been released 
And we might expect that the sentiment to be even higher today as public awareness of hydrogen is growing. So let us hope that the renovation wave, the European Commission has planned for improving people's home and eating, will factor in those objective findings. Ladies and gentlemen, if the European public do not show prejudice to affordable eating, neither should we. Let us eat home in the most affordable and effective and clean way. In parts of Europe, using natural gas will replace coal, oil, improving air quality and reducing the carbon emissions. Blending in biomethane and hydrogen will further that process of reducing the greenhouse gas emission. And this is why Eurogas support the policy of a target of 11% renewable gas in the gaseous fuel mix in 2030, and supporting an overall greenhouse gas emission intensity reduction target of 20% for gaseous fuel by 2030. And this will set us on the pathway to deliver a decarbonized and renewable gas sector by 2050. This is crucial to doubling net zero emission in Europe by 2050. So we hope that the Commission will support the vision of an industry committed to delivering the climate objective of Europe. While we are on the subject of greenhouse gas emission, it is important to mention also our commitment to reducing methane emissions. The European gas industry takes these issues very seriously and is fully committed to reducing our greenhouse gas footprint, including methane. Eurogas has signed up to the methane guiding principles alongside the World Bank, the United Nations, civil society, companies, and many other organizations. And this group is clearly committed to significantly reducing methane emissions as soon as possible. We look forward to the European Commission methane strategy, and we will clearly support regulation targeting the reduction of such emissions. We must look also to how gas can be a solution to methane emission challenge. And in this regard, I'm referring to the opportunity that producing biomethane offers for reducing the methane emission from Europe's biggest producer, which is not energy, but agriculture. Producing biomethane from agricultural waste will significantly reduce the overall methane emission produced in Europe. And at the same time, we will produce a renewable gas that can be injected into the gas grid and reduce the carbon intensity of gas. So this is a huge opportunity for Europe, a win-win. In Eurogas, we are not only taking our climate responsibility, we are also taking our responsibility to people and society by encouraging the utilization of clean gas technologies. Biomethane, for instance, is often produced in anaerobic digesters, and these digesters are produced and deployed here in Europe by European companies. And indeed, the opportunity of gas decarbonization comes with major jobs and growth potential for Europe. Carbon capture and storage components, like steam methane reformers, are also made in Europe. Electrolyzers used to convert renewable electricity into hydrogen are also produced in Europe. LNG engines, made in Europe, here. Hydrogen-ready boilers, made in Europe. Europe is leading the way in clean gas technologies. This is an opportunity for Europe, not only to deploy climate solutions, often made far away, but also to make them on these shores and export them too. The world will need those technologies, not just Europe, if we are to beat climate change. So let us take this opportunity. Let us be global leaders in climate technology manufacturing, not only in deployment. This will bring jobs, this will bring wealth and pride to our European workforce. Eurogas is already working closely with the trade unions on the energy transition and the opportunities of gas, and I'm pleased to say we were of one mind here. Let us build in Europe technology for Europe for European global leadership. Let us not curtail the possibilities of gaseous fuels by earmarking niches for their use. Let us use cost-effective and affordable gas across the European economy. Let us export this technology to the world, showing our leadership and our spirit of partnership at the same time. This will allow us to lead in the manufacturing of clean technology as well as lead in its deployment. 
So the gas industry is exactly the sector that can deliver such leadership for Europe. Let us look forward to another 30 years of success and innovation in the gas sector. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. And thank you very much, Philippe. And thank you for those great uh, words and the sentiment that you've uh, put forward there. Indeed, in Eurogas and the gas industry in Europe, we have a very strong vision for the future, committed to climate neutrality and fully believing that targets will be a very good way for us to be able to reduce the greenhouse gas uh, emissions from the gas sector, whilst also increasing the amount of renewable fuels. And I'm glad that you mentioned the points about uh, the ability for that to be made in Europe, providing jobs and wealth here, uh, because I think that's a very important message that we can certainly uh, deliver upon. And that's a very important part of building public acceptance for the energy transition, as we want everyone to take part in this. So the European opportunity is great. Philippe, thank you so much uh, for your speech today. It's been a great pleasure to see you. As you said, I wish we could have been doing this in person, uh, but the circumstances are such, but maybe next year. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our next uh, keynote speaker is uh, the Commissioner for Energy, Kadri Simpson. Uh, we're very delighted to have her here today with us. Uh, it's the first time she's speaking at the uh, Eurogas uh, annual conference. And we're very, very interested to hear what she has to tell us, uh, seeing as she's sitting on so many important initiatives uh, for us. There are the renovation wave, methane strategy, energy system integration, and hydrogen strategies, and many other things uh, that are currently being cooked in the, uh, in the kitchen of the European Commission. So, Mrs. Simpson, we're very happy to have you with us today, and we're all very eager to hear what you have to say. So, uh, without further ado, I pass the floor to you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, James. And um, first of all, let me can congratulate you, Gus, for uh, 30th anniversary. It has been uh, 30 dynamic years for energy, and in particular for the gas. So, when I think of it, 2050 is exactly 30 years from now, and in these years, so we will have to fundamentally transform our energy system and our economy. Uh, recent months have been a time to rethink the way we live, work, study, and interact. Uh, but when it comes to energy sector, we have been doing some fundamental rethinking uh, for a while already. We know that reaching our climate goals will mean creating a different, more sustainable energy system. Last December, December uh, this Commission put forward its new growth strategy, the European Green Deal, uh, where we commit to climate neutrality by 2050. And with 75% of EU's emissions coming from energy sector, it will be centred at achieving zero emissions. A couple of weeks ago, the Commission proposed a new climate target plan uh, to increase the greenhouse gas reduction target uh, for 2030, to at least 55%, and this adds further urgency to the green energy transition. Reaching 55% is doable, but will require actions in all sectors, and we will not only need to change, but we will need to change fast. 55% reduction of greenhouse gas emission target um, requires energy savings in the range of 39 up to 41% of the final consumption, uh, and in terms of renewable energy, it means a share of renewables of 38 up to 40 percent in the final energy consumption by 2030. The power sector so far has led the way. This is the sector where the renewables could be deployed quickest, driving spectacular cost reductions and reaching a share beyond 30 percent already today. And this trend must continue, but we also have to step up our efforts in the other sectors, in particular heating and cooling transport and industry. In order to get there, we must rethink and renew our energy system. We can no longer act in silos. And we must look at the energy system as a whole, exploit synergies and look for cost-effective solutions for our household and businesses. This rethinking, of course, includes the gas sector. And I'm happy to see that the sector itself is actively participating in this process and broadening its views. Uh, my vision is so that in the energy sector of the future, different technological solutions will compete across sectors and across energy carriers. It should be the consumers who decide what is the most suitable option for them. The provision of energy will transform into providing a service. Therefore, 
the future role of the gas sector will depend on its capacity to keep the pace and to anticipate these changes and to renew itself and its thinking. It will depend on if and how quickly it can move away from fossil sources towards renewable and low carbon gases. It is clear that there is no real alternative to decarbonizing the sector for the longer term. In this context, hydrogen has the potential to be the game changer. It is uh, with this spirit that in July, we put forward our energy system integration and hydrogen strategies. These strategies provide a long-term view on how everything in the energy sector will and should be interlinked. They launch the debate with all stakeholders on uh, how to create the proper framework to make these links interact as efficiently as possible in the interest of consumers. The strategies will be followed by uh, concrete legislative actions and I, I encourage uh, all of you to engage and to contribute to our consultations. The first legislative proposal will be the revised um, guidelines for trans-European energy infrastructure on uh, which our work is intensifying to be ready by the end of this year. We must uh, align the guidelines with our new 2030 and 2050 goals. Infrastructure is the basis for a large part of our energy supply and the first area where better synergies and holistic planning can make a difference. With our existing network and key projects underway, we have today a well-developed and robust uh, gas infrastructure in Europe. And we will need to do, um, we, we will need it um, to deliver secure and um, competitive supplies um, of natural gas to consumers also in the years in transition. But the future will add new needs and we have to anticipate this. As I said, the future energy system will look radically different from today. We will need to optimize our assets, our electricity, gas, heating and hydrogen networks to meet the challenge of climate neutrality. We are taking a new look also at the way we promote energy from renewable sources. We have already done a lot to make our electricity markets uh, fit for green power. With the next year's review of the Renewable Energy Directive and the gas market legislation, we aim to repeat the success on other markets, be it in heating or in the emerging areas of renewable and low carbon gases and fuels. As outlined in our hydrogen strategy, the need to have competitive markets extends to hydrogen and will need appropriate rules for that. Another urgent task of uh, natural gas suppliers, industry and the Commission is to address methane emissions. Our modelling shows that to reach climate neutral and neutrality and uh, our increased 2030 targets, uh, it is not enough to deal only with CO2 emissions. We must tackle also the second biggest greenhouse gas, that is uh, methane. With this in mind, we have been working on, the, on our comprehensive methane strategy that will cover the energy sector, agriculture and also waste. However, it is in energy where we see biggest cost effective potential to rapidly reduce methane emissions. Even, so, even though much of the methane emissions um, in the energy sector can be tackled at zero net cost, this is a field where the EU has not taken action before. Not letting gases escape our system is indispensable also in view of uh, new renewable and low carbon gases that will be part of the future energy mix. I appreciate the strong industry support for tackling this issue and the voluntary initiatives and actions on the ground that is already there. And I'm looking forward to continue working with you on this and on all other issues that we are facing on the road towards a more sustainable energy system. Change is necessary 
but managing this change will be for the benefit of all, uh, for consumers, our economy and our planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Simpson. Indeed, there are some very important sentiments there that we are very happy to share with you. And certainly, as you know, in the Euro Eurogas and the gas industry, we are very much willing to embrace that speed of change that is needed, and indeed to broaden our horizons, as you uh, suggestion, suggested. So yes, we are indeed very happy uh, to see that you understand that we are willing to make those changes and look at the things that we can do alongside natural gas, like biomethane, like hydrogen, and help to frame and uh, deliver those very necessary um, energy products for the energy transition to deliver the ultimate objective of climate neutrality in 2050. We're very much happy that you could join with us today and share, us, uh, with, with, share with us your insights. Um, I should also say on the methane uh, strategy, of course, we're very, very keen uh, to support the work that's being put forward there, as our president also mentioned. And so we will look forward to uh, continuing to work with you and your colleagues uh, across uh, the Commission and in the, in the in other institutions so that we can enjoy uh, a very good and productive way of delivering the energy transition in the most cost-effective way. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I hope you'll be able to stay to see some of the other keynote speakers. And otherwise, we'll certainly be in touch soon. Thank you. And talking of the other institutions, uh, we're very much delighted to have with us as our next two uh, speakers. We will start first with uh, MEP uh, Maria Spiraki uh, from the EPP group in the European Parliament, uh, one of the uh, leading members of the Industry and Energy uh, Committee. And uh, Maria, we're very interested to hear your views on how you see the role of gas up to 2050 and the issues that you're currently working on in the European Parliament that are of relevance for us all today to hear about. Maria, thanks so much. Lovely to see you again. Uh, as we've said, we'd love to be doing this in person, but uh, it is what it is. We do it as well as we can uh, across, across the video, uh, video mechanisms. But uh, over to you. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me and wishing you congratulations for the 30th uh, anniversary. First of all, I would like to, to thank you for the opportunity for giving me the opportunity to talk about the future energy mix. And I would like first on the line that we have to take into account that we have to safeguard security of supplies and affordability to the end users, to our citizens and to the industry as well. In this regard, I would like to focus in four aspects which, according to my opinion, are important ahead of the transition. The first one is time, the second is infrastructure, the third is technology for smooth and fast transition, and the fourth is investments. Natural gas, as you all know, is accepted as a transitional fuel in our Green Deal in order to meet the 2030 targets switching from coal to gas, and I have the opportunity in my country, Greece, and in the region of Western Macedonia, especially in the power sector, is the easiest way to reduce emissions at scale in a very short term. So it is important to take it into account. In this regard, we have also to use the carbon capture storage and the carbon capture use technologies at scale in order to obtain hydrogen as gas. And I think also we have to take into account that we are now ahead of the renovation wave. So we have to encourage the replacement of the old fashioned uh, heat, heating and cooling systems in order to have much more efficient heating and cooling by using also natural gas as a short and midterm solution. But as I have already said, this is a short and maybe a midterm approach. The case is how fast can we enable to future-oriented projects. In this regard, the key element is how to develop huge quantities of hydrogen, green, of course, but also blue or gray in the case in the very short term. In, it is of paramount importance to develop and implement a coherent and concrete European strategy for hydrogen. As hydrogen has a high potential of a clean energy source for the future, and it is considered as a key enabler of energy system integration and the linking of electricity and gas sector. So the key question for me is how can we accelerate transition with leaving no one behind, at the same time you, you, with using gas as a bridge technology? In the transition to a net zero emission EU energy system, hydrogen will play a major role in a smart combination with renewable electricity using Europe's well-development existing energy infrastructure. 
for hydrogen to develop to its full potential, there must be a tangible perspective towards development a well-connected European hydrogen market over time. Having said that, it is a great pleasure to have the Commissioner Sipson with us today. And I would like to take the opportunity and bring her attention to the following issues. I think that the Commission is preparing, preparing fast to meet the targets, but at the same time we're facing some kind of, uh, of, uh, of issues that uh, maybe we have to, to, to receive further explanation. The first example is that the EU hydrogen strategy sets the objective of reaching six gigawatts of renewable hydrogen production by 2024 and uh, a 2030 target of 40 gigawatts. Hydrogen is set to play an important role in meeting the EU's energy and climate targets for 2030 and achieving climate neutrality by 2050. However, in the 2030 target plan, impact assessment, the Commission only foresees 11 to 12 gigawatt of renewable hydrogen production. Probably it's not enough and probably we have to bridge the gap. We have to, to secure the security of supply. And the question is if in the meantime we can use natural gas or we can use a mix or we can, or we can use a blend. But we have to answer this question. And of course the second question is concerned the the, the details that the, the Clean Hydrogen Alliance needs in order to put in place, uh, in order to put in place the schedules, uh, the schedules investments in the transition to the net zero, zero emissions in the energy system, we can understand that we need a lot of steps. But the first one, as I can, I can say, is how can we upgrade the existing gas infrastructure? Infrastructures are an asset. According to my opinion, infrastructures are a, are a huge asset. And we cannot have stranded assets after the period of transition. In this regard, we have to, to improve the, the capacity and we have also to use the existing infrastructure in order to, to, to go ahead with the transition. For instance, in cases where hydrogen consumers are located away from large supply or renewable electricity or, CC, or, or CCS locations and have access to existing gas grids, it will be cost effective to receive hydrogen through gas grids. Existing gas infrastructure can be used with some modification to safely transport hydrogen. In addition, the connection to a hydrogen network increases security of supply significantly. Pipeline transport is far cheaper compared to hydrogen transport via shipping. However, the latter could become relevant for very long distance. But the pipeline transport of hydrogen can either take the form of blending shares of hydrogen with methane or can, now can be blending with natural gas or other uh, renewable gases. So blending makes sense today when hydrogen volumes are small. When hydrogen volumes increase while transported volumes of natural gas decrease, dedicated hydrogen transport will emerge, initially connecting industrial clusters and later connecting regional and national hydrogen infrastructure. In the same time, we have to build additional infrastructure. And in this regard, the, the answer that we have already received from the Commission it, is it, it will have a huge cost. So we have to know what about the criteria that we are going ahead. And we have to know how can we finally have the so-called the hydrogen backbone uh, uh, during the period of time that we have already have the, the existing gas infrastructure. In order to have uh, proper technology, and I would like to conclude with this, in order to have proper technology and infrastructure for, for doing the transition, it is also important to provide adequate funding for research and innovation. I would like just to read a few words coming from the German National Hydrogen Strategy, which said that reliable, affordable and sustainable ways of producing hydrogen are essential for its future use. Now it is the time to construct a demonstration plant at an industrial scale and scale this up further to ensure that the cost of hydrogen production decreases considerably. In addition, the German National Hydrogen Strategy concludes that the current framework does not allow hydrogen to be generated and used in an economically viable manner. So, we need natural gas, not only as a bridge technology, but also as a short and mid-term solution in order to keep the affordability alive. And I think that it is of paramount importance. At the same time, we have to increase the capacity of our, of our uh, uh, research and innovation in order to have the proper technology. 
In this regard, we have to stand together with the Commission on the negotiation of 2021 to 2027 multiannual financial and MFF in order to increase the amount of funding for research and innovation and involve all stakeholders, including member states and the private sector, to develop new technologies from power to X. Once again, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, very, very interesting points and indeed quite enlightening. I think you picked on many important issues, uh, certainly for the gas sector. And I could just pick a handful of them and say, yes, we still see the need for the coal to gas switching, the carbon capture and storage, which we need to see deployed and brought to scale. Uh, indeed, hydrogen, which is a very good vector for the decarbonization of the gas system. And importantly, you mentioned the necessary necessity to use the inf infrastructure, the blending. Uh, and certainly in Eurogas, we see that as definitely the first step, uh, because this would be the most cost effective way of bringing those uh, particular molecules into our system. Of course, it is also important that we see strategies. You mentioned the German strategy, and we have the European Union one. And uh, these strategies will be very important, and we have great hopes for things like the Clean Hydrogen Alliance at the European level to identify shovel-ready projects and get them built, because we have to deploy now. But thank you so much, Maria. Again, I will say to you, thank you also for the birthday wishes. Uh, we wish we could have been doing this in person, uh, but thank you so much for spending the time with us, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is Vilan Anisto. Uh, he is a Finnish uh, Green MEP and is indeed uh, the leader of the Greens in the Industry and Energy Committee of the European Parliament. Uh, we're very interested to see what uh, Mr. Nunisto has to, has to say today and his own view uh, for the role of uh, gas to 2050. Uh, Vila, welcome. Good afternoon. Yeah. Over to you, Vila. Thanks so much for being here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much and, and good afternoon to all. It's a pleasure to be here and I guess as a Green politician, an MEP for Greens and a former Minister of the Environment for Finland, my role here is to, today to spur Eurogas to be something totally different 30 years from now than it is uh, today. And this transformation is already started, so obviously uh, we need to hasten it. Uh, the, the energy sector has transformed before, but the challenge ahead of us is larger than any we have uh, seen in such a short period. Uh, if you think about Europe's carbon neutrality goal by 2050, it's obvious that there will be a very limited, if uh, any, role for any fossil fuels by 2050. So we have to go into solutions that are sustainable and mainly based on renewable energy options. Uh, but this is not just a European change. To address climate change, this is happening globally. So the markets are shifting very fast into renewables, into sustainable zero carbon solutions. And it would be very important for European industry in this field to realize that it's better for us to invest directly to sustainable solutions, uh, zero carbon solutions already today as much as possible, and not try to look for interim fixes where we actually can create stranded assets, where we would invest into something that can limit emissions uh, narrowly for the next 10 years, but do not uh, create a sustainable pathways to zero carbon economy by 2050. And this is the big challenge for the gas sector, where I would very much urge you to think about not creating stranded assets, not try to keep up the fossil fuel bubble, but try to get rid of it in a sustainable manner as soon as possible by investing into renewable gases and other energy solutions that are sustainable, mainly based on renewable energy. Um, Obviously, the backdrop to this is the climate emergency. This is a global phenomenon and, and it's affecting whole our li livelihoods in Europe, but elsewhere as well. And the faster we change our economies, the more we will get of the technological leadership and, and uh, uh, export possibilities uh, as Europe uh, in, in solving the climate crisis and maintaining uh, sustainable living for our, our citizens in the future. So this is a challenge where the decision makers have to get industries involved and try to make sure that it's the European industries that are part of the solution, not part of the problem. We need to rapidly decarbonize and energy sector has a lot of emissions to cut from. 76% of our emissions come from energy sector where fossil fuels still dominate in most countries. And citizens support climate action. Eurobarometer says that 92% of EU citizens support the net zero goal by 2050. So uh, there is big support for this policy and the European climate law has to be an answer to this call. Uh, the solution to cutting emissions is uh, cutting deeply the use of fossil fuels, including fossil gas. 
Increasing energy efficiency is a top priority of the Commission and the Greens support this very much in the Parliament. Energy consumption, for example, in European building stock can be cut by 80%. This decreases use of fossil gas significantly by looking at more sustainable ways of, of uh, producing heat and, and cooling for our citizens and, and energy also to housing. Renewable electrification is key in our decarbonization effect. Sector integration obviously also is very largely dependent on renewable power in order to facilitate that there are uh, sustainable sources for energy. Electrifying industry, electrifying heat, electrifying transport and using waste heat better, they are all part of the solution. We need to start uh, thinking also about decommissioning infrastructure that is not in line with the climate goals in a way which is predictable and sustainable. And also the industries have to be part of this, this debate, how to do that uh, in a way where we actually increase European competitiveness, but also achieve our climate targets. But obviously we can't stop using energy and we can't electrify everything because electrification costs in some specific areas are going to be too high. So there will be need for other solutions and there is a role for renewable gases. So I very much urge the European gas sector to look into those uh, possibilities because this is something that European can take, European industries can take uh, global leadership. Uh, renewable hydrogen and a sustainable amount of, of uh, biogas from sustainable sources, uh, those are the solutions that, that we can look into in the future. Uh, if the gas industry does not shift to renewable gases, it's obvious that its competitiveness will, will de de be depleted uh, by time with the increasing climate ambitions. So this is also the, the obvious cause for the gas industry. It will become a fossil, not needed, if it's not changing the source of its energy. It's, uh, EU fossil fuel companies are waking to this. So this is uh, something that I would very much like to, to give you a heads up on that, that you continue on this path because if you compare the American companies and European companies, there is very much still uh, more movement in Europe in this front. And this is a movement we as decision makers have to accelerate, support you in this, in this change, make it uh, sustainable, make it go across the board. Um, and sometimes uh, some of the actions are still a bit too much greenwashing, uh, more PR. So this is something that needs to be thought through in the, in the industry. Uh, short term solutions are not going to be enough anymore. So, so it has to be a systemic change, a holistic change of how energy is seen, how it is produced, where it comes from. And this is something where we can make this uh, change happen together. The gas sector needs to identify where molecules are needed where more efficient options or electrification are not possible. And that is where the future market will lie. Energy efficiency will also be first. So, so the role of gas is coming after that. But uh, renewable hydrogen has some downsides. Electrolysis efficiency is about 30%. So 70% of energy uh, is lost, at least at the moment, and synthetic methane even less efficient. So this means that electricity needs to be renewable and its use has to be thought through well. Obviously, there are areas like heavy transport, maritime transport, uh, heavy industries where hydrogen will be necessary to be developed and it should be developed straight away from renewables in order to create sustainable leadership in this new technology. But this is a way of uh, creating uh, European industries of future where they can be carbon neutral starting from steel industry. And this is something where we decision makers have to support R&D and investment in these kind of solutions that we get green gases uh, to decarbonize the industry. Public money in the climate transition has better uses than subsidizing fossil gas. So all European money needs to go directly to green gases and electrification and renewables, sustainable forms of energy, sustainable ways of using energy. And this is something I very much urge you to do as much as possible. I know the commissioner said already a lot of the things I'm saying, but I'm saying them a bit more, more uh, actively and maybe a bit more aggressively. But I think this is very much in the need uh, and, and interest of the European industries as well, because this is where leadership can be found, not in interim solutions. Uh, we should also think about what is fair. Uh, the fossil fuel companies obviously have been causing uh, a lot of the climate crisis. So, so how this transition should be done? Who should be responsible? Who should pay for it? The companies need to show also societal leadership here that they put money into doing this also willingly and not just wait, waiting for legal action. And one area where you can do more is methane strategy in the short term. Methane leakages is a big problem 
where we can address the, the emissions of the fossil uh, gas sec sector. So methane uh, emissions should be tackled straight away and limited so we can in the short term also make gains in, in reducing emissions, harmful emissions uh, to the atmosphere. But obviously, this is uh, not the long-term vision. We need to do everything we can do in the short term to make sure that we don't create too much CO2 or methane emissions. But the long-term solution is making an energy system which is zero carbon, energy efficiency is strong, and gases play a role in making sure that our livelihoods are as good as possible, but they are from sustainable sources. And this is the challenge you have ahead of you in the next 30 years. When you take this challenge on board, we as political, political decision makers will support you in this. We want European industries to be the technological leaders, the job creators in this. And this is something I think the parliament is very much behind. So good luck in that process and we are going to do it as fast as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vila. Uh, I don't think you're aggressive. I think you're just giving us a very stark message that you want us to take action upon, which I'm happy to say that almost everything you're saying we can agree with. I think there are parts that we would probably discuss uh, on another day and say, yes, these are elements we might not agree with. But certainly the vision that we have involves energy efficiency, renewable electrification where it makes sense, and the building of uh, renewable and decarbonized gases. This is where I think we probably will have discussions in the future. But certainly we will see that that is the direction this industry is committed to going to. And this isn't about greenwashing, this is about action. And we're very much into the deploy now. And let's build that hydrogen and biomethane gas uh, system for the future. So we are very much in that way of mind. We do think this is the right direction to go. And we fully take our responsibility. And I'm glad you mentioned methane emissions as well. That is an area where we do see a uh, great opportunity because we are already addressing that issue and we must work more with our stakeholders, with the NGOs, with the European Commission, with the UN and deliver very quickly uh, with uh, our other partners like the IEA upon systems that can actually monitor and really deliver quickly uh, the reduction in those methane emissions because that will have a big impact in the short term. One of the reasons why we call for a greenhouse gas intensity reduction target uh, for uh, the gaseous fuels by 2030, because that would also apply not just to carbon, but to methane. And we think that that's the right kind of tool to put pressure on the industry to act. So we're very much of the mind that you are on many things. There are other things we will have to discuss. Uh, but Vila, really appreciate you spending the time with us uh, this afternoon. We look forward to seeing you again. And uh, really, have a great afternoon. Thanks for spending time with us. Ladies and gentlemen, we're moving on to our final keynote speaker. Um, and that is indeed uh, Christoph Jugel, uh, who is the head of energy policy in Dana, which is the German uh, energy agency. Uh, Christoph in person is definitely something worth to see. <laughs> so it's a pity we have to do it like this, Christoph, uh, because the last time that we had a conference together, you were rolling up your sleeves and taking your jacket off. But I'm sure that you've got still very important messages to pass to the audience today. So I'll hand over to you without further ado. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure being here. And actually, I wasn't planning on this, but you're right. I should continue with this because this was actually the gesture I was um, showing towards all the European politicians saying, hey, enough of talk. We have to get action right now. And I'm very happy um, being here for today. Congratulations to your 30th anniversary. anniversary. We haven't met 30 times um, yet, but we have to make it 30 times as often in the future than in the past. So very happy being here. Thank you very much. Just one remark, it's really hard being a speaker of the, such remembers to, such a lineup of speakers. But there's one thing I'd like to highlight here. Did anybody notice uh, Philippe and Maria, for example, were talking about zero emissions by 2050, whilst Patrick was talking about climate neutrality by 2050. And this is very different. I will come to this in a moment. Okay, um, just a few remarks on this. I'm really happy that we have such clear comments from the commission as well as from members of parliament that we do see such ambitious goals. So net zero carbon, net climate um, emissions by 2050 is really a strong goal. What's important right now is making it a strong roadmap, a strong pathway as well. Because right now the roadmap is blurred with uncertainties. There's regulatory questions, market design questions. So the open question is, uh, what about electrons and molecules and all this? And I'm going to talk about this for a second. But what's very important is that we really make a strong transformatory path, strong roadmap out of those strong goals. Because one thing that was already mentioned several times, and I'm happy that Maria said it, Bill said it as well, let's make sure that investments are really taken on right now. We need long-term investment and planning stability for making all this come true. 
one thing, what's the goal for you said? So the goal is actually the climate neutrality by 2050. So the goal is not just carbon emissions, it's not just greenhouse gas emissions, but it's making sure that climate change stops. And this is very, um, very important. So what's the effect on the markets on there? Well, actually what's at stake, the whole energy system. You said before that you're hoping for a different Eurogas by 2050, and I'm sure there's going to be a different Eurogas by then, because the whole energy is turning upside down. And one aspect that's very important in here is that we can only achieve all this with an integrated energy system approach. And remember, we've been talking about this and discussing about this a lot, that the energy transition in an integrated view is much more than just sector coupling, it's much more than just linking up together different technical devices, but, but it's a strong approach bringing together different um, consumer groups, different request authorities, and different regulatory frameworks, and so on. Why are we talking about this? Because in the past, we've been talking so much about electrons, and this is important, and you know I've been talking about this in the past already, that all studies that I'm aware of do show a further electrification for good sense, and electrification or direct use of electricity in the end energy use is going to be to, to grow up to well between 40 to 60 percent but 40 to 60 percent electricity in end energy use still means 60 to 40 percent of molecules in energy and what's important on this is we do not have uh, only to talk about energy supply and energy systems but we have to make sure that we're finding solutions for the overall feedstock supply and demand so this is much more than just the electrons we've been talking about in the past. So we are talking about power fuels, about um, gases and liquid fuels that are based on green electricity that are produced synthetically that can deliver basic, well, basic materials as well as energy, energy carriers. And those feedstocks can be used for many different use cases. You do already know this, that hydrogen is just a power fuel. It's just one of the most prominent ones because this is the the starting point for many other power fuels that are then being used or being produced by methanization, the fischer tropsch process, methanol synthesis, and what is all this. But all these together, power fuels in general, help us to avoid carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. And this is why they are so important. So in the past, um, I've been talking about that we have to make sure that energy transition is more than just those two pillars making energy efficiency readjusted towards a systematic approach, a holistic approach, and making sure that we do see renewable energies and feedstocks. And it's important that we make sure that we do see those renewable energies and feedstocks, both on the electron side as well as on the molecule side. Today, when listening to Katri and listening what that she's talking about, climate neutrality, we have to make sure that it's more than this, we have to make sure that we're also talking about negative emission technologies. And this is something we have to keep in mind, maybe not in Eurogas in your core strategy, but you have to keep in mind that this is much more than just reducing methane emissions, for example. We've been talking about hydrogen a lot, and we've, we've heard about hydrogen a lot. We've heard about different national hydrogen strategies and just some remarks. Yes, you probably have all seen that Germany has been publishing its hydrogen strategy last year, having very ambitious overall goals. Um, so Germany is really trying to assume global responsibility, really trying to make hydrogen a competitive option as one important key role and key option in the energy transition. And we might, uh, we would like to help um, building up domestic and international markets and making all this in an European approach. So it's very important that Germany in here stands in close cooperation with France, for example, with the Netherlands and with many more European countries. And it's very important that Germany really, well, takes it serious. I mean, um, our federal government was, or is, is planning, is going to spend more than 9 billion euros for investments in hydrogen projects, there are 2 billion euros for international projects. So this is huge. But what's important for us is that hydrogen has a special role, but it's not the silver bullet. Hydrogen is not the solution to all our problems. So we have to make sure that we're thinking about all the different demands, energy carriers and feedstocks. And I, we have to make sure to find the right solution for the right problem. So hydrogen enables locally emission-free applications in many sectors, as well as the decarbonization of many industry processes. This is huge, this is very important. Hydrogen is the basis for many other synthetic energy carriers and feedstocks, very important. Hydrogen enables global trade 
of carbon neutral energy carriers and feedstocks. This is something that many other carriers or many other um, sources of energy and feedstocks they were not able in the past. So hydrogen really delivers very important advantages and has a key role, but it's not a silver bullet for all our problems. So I'd like to refer to hydrogen as the daughter of cheap electrons and the mother of highly valuable molecules. So what's very important in here for you, Eurogas, and the whole gas sector and the energy sector is make sure that green molecules play a role because they have to play a role and make sure that you as the gas industry really take this as an historic chance and you have to change, you have to change fast, as Kadi was saying before. So we have to make sure that we are really innovating and scaling up. So I've been discussing a lot with colleagues of mine. Uh, if I'm demanding from the gas sector, you have to scale up. What's the problem in there? Well, the problem is there that there is no scale up for pilot projects that are not profitable by now. So this is something that goes towards the European Commission and European politicians. We have to make sure that those projects reach profitability. We need scale, yes, and we need an EU regulatory framework that fosters renewable energy carriers and feedstocks over their fossil counterparts. Sorry for that. It's important for making sure that those projects really come to life. So we have to foster the dialogue in here with politicians and other sectors to really shape the sector integration, to really shape a meaningful integration. And we have to also touch for the end consumers and allow consumers to participate in this transition, for example, by starting to giving them the choice for greener or more renewable product offers. For example, in the gas station, where's the gas offer in the station that I could choose for, for well, cho choosing the greener or the more renewable solution? So last remark on there is the energy transition just has no alternative. And this is why, well, actually, I'm missing a requisite for now. I'd need a skull in there saying, okay, because it's to be or not to be. That's the question. So this is the last sentence I'd read to, like, like to read to Eurogas. And this is where I'm, I'd, I'd like to switch back to James, please. Thank you, Christoph. Don't worry, I don't think we're going to be playing Hamlet and waiting and waiting and waiting and never taking action until it's too late. I think we're well much on the case. Fully agree with you on the silver bullet point. Hydrogen is not a silver bullet, but no, it's, neither is energy efficiency or renewable electricity or hydrogen on its own. Together, it's an and, an and, an and scenario, and we'll need them all. And so we fully uh, understand and agree with you when you're talking about the silver bullets. And there is a lot of hype around hydrogen, which is a good thing, because it's an important part of the missing p uh, puzzle that we need to go in that direction. Uh, um, but yes, we do have to make sure that all of the right issues are uh, taken forward with the right policy frameworks. As ever, Christoph, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. And really, uh, I find your insights very, very, very um, enlightening so that we are able to think again in Eurogas how we also need to go forward and the ideas that you've put forward. We don't necessarily always say that it just is about green molecules because we do believe very strongly in decarbonized molecules. And that is a transition technology as well that we will see for how long that transition will be would also be important because it will keep the cost of things like hydrogen down. So. We would like to see more of a mixed approach, I would say, in general on that. But anyway, Christoph, next time let's do this in person. I'll take off my jacket as well, and we can both roll up our sleeves, and we can do this and get this thing moving. Uh, Christoph, thank you. Have a really great afternoon. It's been a great pleasure to see you again. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that brings this segment to a close. And uh, I am delighted uh, that I will be handing over the rest of this conference uh, to Sasha Twining. She's a journalist. Uh, she's from radio and TV. You're probably familiar with her from the BBC World Service. And she's done this for Eurogas for many years and is an absolute top quality professional. She's going to put me to shame. Sasha, it's over to you to take us through the rest of this very, very, and I hope very exciting and challenging debate because we've got a lot of people who are pro-electrification in the conference today. So it's in your, your careful hands uh, to bring this through to its conclusion in a couple of hours. Uh, good luck and thanks for being with us. Over to you. James, thank you very much, and thank you for that very flattering introduction. I have to say, first of all, um, it is a shame not to be there in person, but thank you for having me again this year. And yes, as you've been saying, maybe next year will be different. Look, welcome to you wherever you are, wherever you are watching this at the moment. Maybe you are watching this now that you're back in the office. Maybe you are sitting at home. Maybe you're in, you're in your living room. Maybe you're in a makeshift office across the kitchen table. Wherever you are watching us, thank you 
for making us part of your afternoon and for joining in with the 30th anniversary celebrations as well. So yes, we have got a couple of panels for you this afternoon, but I wanna make this absolutely clear. We may not all be in the same room, but let's bring everyone's thoughts and opinions and questions together as much as we possibly can. So you may well already have noticed that underneath the window of the live stream that you are watching, there is a chat box. Now, please, at any time, feel free to ask questions to any of our panelists or indeed on anything that you've already heard that you would like their opinions on. This is not just gonna be us talking at you. We very much want this to be a two-way conversation this afternoon. And don't just wait till the end of the panel. As soon as you think of a question, please send it to us and I'll put as many as possible to our panelists as much time as I have possible. So let's uh, introduce our first panellists this afternoon. Uh, we're going to look ahead to 2030 and 2050 and try and imagine if we possibly can what sort of gas system we might actually have, how that will work and actually the challenges in getting there as well, the positives as well as the challenges. So I'm very pleased to say that we have with us this afternoon, first of all, Giles Dixon, the CEO of Wind Europe. Good to see you there, Giles. Uh, Frau Patisse, the executive director of Smartin. Hello, Frauke. Thank you for your time. Also joining us, Jan Ingwersen, the general director of Ensog. Good to see you again, Jan. And Clara Paletti, the chair of the board of regulators at ASA. Thank you so much for joining us, whether we've joined you in your home or maybe in your office. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Now, what we would like to do is uh, give all of you an opportunity to spend maybe a few minutes just explaining your vision for 2030 and 2050 and how you see that energy system um, evolving and uh, being very successful then. So what sort of energy system would we be looking at? Now, in no particular order, let's start with Giles Dixon from Wind Europe. Giles, tell us what your vision is. Thank you very much, Sasha. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to start from what I know best, which is wind energy. Wind is 15% of Europe's electricity consumption today. Solar PV is another 5%. So that means variable renewables are now 20% of all of the electricity we consume. By 2030, we expect wind to be somewhere between 27 and 30% of all of the electricity we consume in Europe. That's based on our current pipeline of projects that we are developing, and it's based on the commitments that governments have made in their national energy and climate plans for the expansion of wind energy. By 2050, the European Commission says that wind needs to be 50% of Europe's electricity. That's what they say in their decarbonisation scenarios. Is that deliverable? Yes, it is. We have the technology. Wind, moreover, is now the cheapest form of power generation in most of Europe. The only thing that beats it in certain parts of Europe is solar PV. It is now even cheaper to build wind farms in many parts of Europe than it is to operate existing coal and gas plants. So 50% of electricity in 2050 will be wind. But of course, the key question here is what will be the share of electricity in our energy mix in 2050? Today, it is only 21%. The European Commission say that electricity should be around 50% of our energy mix by 2050. We believe that it can and should be 62% of the energy mix. That is achievable technically, and it also makes economic sense. Just for the detail, that 62% we believe would break down as follows, that 51% of transport would be electric, 64% of energy consumption in buildings would be electric, and 86% of energy consumption in industry would be electric. Does this make sense? We firmly believe that it does. Electricity, in terms of the primary energy consumption, is more energy efficient than fossil fuels. Electric vehicles consume less energy than combustion engines. Electric heat pumps consume less energy than even the most efficient gas 
boilers. Now, this still leaves 38% of the energy mix, which won't be electric. There are many things we just physically, technically cannot electrify. How do we see that 38%? We believe that between 10 and 15% will be hydrogen. By 2050, hopefully, most if not all of it, renewable hydrogen. We think 5% will be e-fuels. And that still leaves quite a lot, around 20% of the energy mix. We're not quite sure. We don't have the expertise ourselves, of course, what it's going to be. People talk about biogas a lot. We note that in their latest scenarios for 2050, DNV, GL, C, biogas accounting for 2% of the energy demand in Europe's buildings. I'll end with one final observation, something that gives us conviction about the numbers that I have described and the huge energy transition that implies is what is happening on the demand side. Five years ago, Europe's industrial energy consumers did not like renewables. They thought we were expensive. We were much more expensive then than we are today. And they thought also that our so-called intermittency was going to mess up the functioning of the energy system. Today, we have the chemicals, steel, cement, many other energy intensive industrial sectors knocking on our door saying, we want to decarbonize, whether it's through direct electrification or indirectly through renewable hydrogen, and we want you to help. Can you build a wind farm, please? Next to the factory, or perhaps linked to the factory with a cable or perhaps some virtual connection via a PPA. We recognize that you are cheap and we want to be powered by wind. That was unthinkable just five years ago. We see similar developments on the demand side in the public sector as well. Look at the commitments that municipal, regional governments are making on decarbonization, turning to renewables. And it's this trend on the demand side above all else that gives us confidence that we're going to see the sort of figures and an energy transition that I've described. Thank you. Giles, thank you very much. Thank you for your, your thoughts and opinions. Um, anything that you would like to raise with Giles, anything that maybe you do or don't agree with, um, make sure you send your questions and I'll put them all to our panellists when we've heard from everyone. Um, Frauke, if I may, let me come to you first, uh, second rather. Uh, Frauke Tees from Smart End. I think we might have a problem with your sound. Is it working now? That's now working. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much, Franka. <laughs> so welcome. We might have missed anything that you might have said at the beginning, if you wouldn't mind repeating. Okay, thank you very much, Sasha. And it's a pleasure to be here at this very diverse uh, event and, and setup. Uh, and like Giles, I would like to start with the perspective that I know best, and that's the electricity side. Um, and relating to your question, what is going to be the dominant vector or what are the dominant vectors? I think when we look at electricity, no matter how you turn it, renewables are both from a sustainability side as well as from an economic side, the solution and the dominant way forward. And Giles just quoted some, uh, some references there. So very clear. But it's also equally clear that renewables won't do it alone. They are variable, most of them, and especially the dominant resources, wind and solar. They need flexibility as a complementarity. And here, the most efficient uh, solution is from within the system itself. And by that, I mean the network management, the interconnection and balancing across regions, and then very importantly, to leverage the flexibility from the demand side. Um, and this is something that is already happening. And I was very pleased to, um, to hear Giles's final words on the industry knocking at uh, wind energy stores uh, and wanting to, to uh, be supplied with renewables. And they are knocking at our doors because they want to participate with their flexibility into the energy system. And that's what we're already seeing. Aluminium smelters adjusting their demand in order to bridge variability in the power system. 
supermarket chains that have equipped their heating, ventilation, air conditioning to react to variabilities and provide flexibility to the system. Um, I could go on and on about existing players that currently are mainly on the industrial and commercial scale uh, participating already in providing flexibility to the system. But I think this gets even more interesting if we look further and we look beyond the current reality of the electricity system. If we look into system integration, which is starting to happening and starting to speed up. Because with more and more electrification of heating and transport, we will also uh, open doors to leveraging more sources of flexibility. Smart charging of electric vehicles, even vehicle to grid is something that, that uh, many of our members are already doing and that is becoming increasingly interesting with the growing numbers of electric vehicles in the system. Similarly, uh, the smart steering of electrified heating, heat pumps uh, in, in well-insulated buildings above all offers a massive uh, opportunity. Uh, so a lot can be done across this vector of renewables, um, smart system management, demand side flexibility. And I would argue uh, in response to the, your question, this is going to be the dominant vector. And now you've probably been wondering, what am I doing here at a gas conference, telling you about this dominant vector and getting, uh, getting impatient? And yes, it's true. There will be moments when additional capacity will be needed, both in the near term and on a seasonal basis. Um, and there will be certain industrial processes that cannot be fully electrified. There will maybe be seasonal storage issues where gaps will need to be filled. And this is where forms of storage come in, including uh, gaseous storage that can absorb ex excess capacities when, when we have surplus generation and release them uh, at, at other moments. And I think this is where, where we count on you as the gas industry. Um, and this is, I think, where, where we need to look beyond individual vectors and, and work towards a transition in the end that, that will be consistent and work from everyone, uh, for everyone. But bearing in mind that clearly the, the ultimate uh, parameter is going to be the emissions, and that's what we've heard before. So if we look at the gases uh, combination, it needs to be a carbon-free one. Strauka, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your, your thoughts and opinions. Uh, it's very, very interesting, and I'm sure will provoke a lot of debate among everyone listening. Remember to send us your questions. Um, Jan, let's come to you next uh, with your thoughts on this one. Jan Ingwersen, the uh, General Director of ENSOG. Thank you very much, Sasha. Uh, I, I think the, the camera is a little bit behind, but I hope you can hear me now. We can. Um, thank you for, for the, the intro. Um, I think it's a, we are starting a very interesting discussion here, but also a discussion that we, uh, to, in my view, may have had too many times, uh, the, the battle between electricity and gas. For, for Seen from our perspective, there's no, no doubt, and I have full respect of uh, what is going to be achieved uh, for electricity. Uh, electricity is today 21%, uh, 22% of the total energy consumption and will increase to, to 50% plus minus. Um, I mean, uh, we have in the next uh, uh, 30 years, we will, we will um, see whether it will be 48 or 52 or uh, maybe even 62, I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm not a strong believer in that, but anyway, it's not so important, I think, to discuss now. What I think is is really important, and, and uh, I, I have to uh, to congratulate the Commission with with the, the two uh, strategies that they launched here in July: the, the hydrogen strategy and the uh, the energy system integration strategy, which is basically uh, including or embracing the fact that uh, maybe in the in the in the neighborhood of fifty percent will be electricity. Uh, and but the fifty percent will be something else, and uh, gas is ready to pay uh, play uh, an important role and to play to live up to the responsibility of uh, aiming for decarbonization, aiming for carbon neutrality by two thousand and fifty. Um, and we are, um, you could say, 
already starting that now in, in, in the discussions that we are having um, internally in the gas sector. And we are also doing that uh, together with the electricity sector with, uh, and, and in particular for, for instance, for, Enso, for ENSOC, we are having uh, um, uh, an intensive uh, cooperation with ENSOE on, on uh, scenarios to be, uh, to be used for the future interlinkage between electricity and gas. So I think a lot of things are going on. And I think this, uh, the fact that we have to work together in order to lift uh, this huge challenge that we have in front of us, that the decarbonization, the, uh, the, the carbon neutrality by 2050 is the goal, not whether it's gas or whether it's electricity. Electricity will be a dominant vector, yes, but still only in a magnitude of 50%. Um, so hereby, let's let's bury the, the 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 conflicts here. Let's look for where we where we can cooperate. Um, maybe we have different uh, viewpoints on uh, exactly which role. I think that will require a lot of uh, of uh, discussions, and uh, um, and and we are ready to enter into that. Let me briefly mention the, the gas grids uh, that I'm representing. Uh, we, we are now, or have already last year, uh, with our roadmap for 2050, uh, identified some pathways for decarbonization, methane pathway, hydrogen pathway, and a blending. And we think that all these pathways will be in use. Um, and now the, there is a strong focus on hydrogen. Hydrogen will not be a silver bullet, but it will be, I think, a strong component here. And I think uh, what is uh, some of the features of doing this, uh, and, and again here, let's, uh, let's underline, uh, emphasize that decarbonization and uh, carbon neutrality is the goal, that the, uh, using the gas grids for biogas, for hydrogen, whether it's, it's in the beginning is, is green, blue, or, or even other colors, is an efficient way of, of uh, decarbonizing. The grids are already there, so uh, and and the um, the cost of repurposing the gas grid or parts of the gas grids is is relatively limited. Limited, and uh, one aspect which I think has been not mentioned so often is that the land rights and the permissions to use the land is already there. It, we do not have the same uh, conflicts that we have seen in other uh, uh, cases with new uh, building new infrastructure. And then I think a, a, a further thing which has not been mentioned that much, if converting or repurposing gas grids to hydrogen, then it's not a matter of stranded asset or uh, um, uh, stranded investment in any case and, and decommissioning. Then it's converted to hydrogen, and we the gas system has been based on hydrogen before. When we were uh, in the uh, with with the town gas, the main part of that was was hydrogen. So it can be done, and but when changed to hydrogen, then for the transportation, for the compressors, for the consumption uh, part, for the distribution part, there's not so much a, a, a difference what kind of hydrogen it is. Then you can focus on decarbonizing the production. But it, the hydrogen per se is the same. So I think we should um, uh, congratulate the commission with the, with the visions for hyd the hydrogen strategy and for the energy system integration. We will be working hard for that. And, um, and um, I'm happy to discuss further with, with you and, uh, and others on this issue. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you very much. Thank you. Some, uh, some interesting thoughts there and looking forward to actually putting some of your points uh, to Frauke and to Giles as well. Once we've heard finally from Clara Paletti, the chair of the Board of Regulators at ASA. Clara, over to you. Gosh, uh, it's such a pleasure to be here in, uh, for such an interesting discussion. Uh, the way I look at your question is maybe slightly different because the first question that comes to my mind is whether the toolbox that we as regulators have been using for over 30 years is fit for purpose for the future. If I compare our current energy systems to what we had 30 years ago, I see that many things have changed. We have a, a much higher share of renewables, a better integrated market, more flexible, 
a lot of new uh, infrastructures and uh, uh, even uh, more active uh, consumers. Uh, but the way we uh, moved and uh, the, the approach we, we have taken to get to this point has been stable, let me say. We have been moving along the same uh, frame, regulatory framework, improving it at the margin. So the question to me is, do we need to adapt significantly the framework for the future? Do we need really to change the toolbox or the current one will be fit for purpose. Um, of course, this is a very, very, very difficult question, but uh, uh, my answer would be that we, uh, what I see in, uh, uh, by 2050, is a completely different energy system, both from on the, the supply side and on the demand side. So when we look so far away, I think we have to imagine new regulatory uh, frameworks and uh, uh, even uh, we have to imagine uh, an uh, upgraded market designs. Um, so on the one side, the challenge is I want to implement what we have now. We have to finish what we are doing. We have to give certainty to the markets. On the other side, we have to be forward looking and visionary, visionary enough to ask ourselves if there is anything that we really need to start changing right now. And I think that the, the experience from the last years uh, give us some lesson learned, at least. I don't have the recipe to, to say how the future should change, but at least I can um, sort of uh, uh, give you some reflection on what I see as lessons learned. First of all, I think we should not talk about decarbonization per se because local impacts, air quality, um, protection of our soil, they have proved very important objectives, at least at national level. And when designing, when designing the, the regulatory tools, we have to consider uh, this very complex set of constraints and, and, and objectives, because otherwise the risk is that we design a very nice theoretical framework, but then uh, the framework uh, uh, doesn't uh, progress uh, as much as possible because of uh, barriers, let's say. So uh, be conscious that uh, the word is more complicated than just decarbonizing. Second lesson learned is the integrated approach is necessary. We really need to make sure that the best value uh, technologies to decarbonize are uh, chosen. So how do we choose the future? Uh, I see that here we have people, now you, you are discussing which one will be the, the, the best energy vector for the future. My uh, viewpoint as regulator is how uh, can I allow the market and the operators to drive the system towards the best solution? Because otherwise I'm, uh, that would be sort of a, a planning approach, a planning approach that hasn't worked in the past. So I have to let the market work as much as possible and give incentives to um, align, align uh, the interest from the public, the consumers and the investors. So that's the, the, the way I have to look, in my view, at this incentive uh, energy system for the future. Then finally, uh, uh, one remark on uh, uh, market integration and liquidity. I think whatever the scenario is going to be for the future, and I don't know, I don't know which one would prevail, I don't know which technology, uh, I have to make sure that enough flexibility is kept in the system and uh, uh, that uh, liquidity and market integration is preserved. Because sometimes I see a tendency to move from a wide market to very local uh, dimension. So I have to make sure that the, the local dimension that I was mentioning at the beginning as well uh, becomes compatible with a fully efficient and integrated market. Otherwise, I'm going to lose this EU uh, dimension that have been, we have been working for uh, all over these years. Thank you very much. Clara, thank you very much uh, for your thoughts on that one. Some very 
interesting uh, uh, opinions expressed and a lot of questions as well for all four of you. Remember, if you'd like to ask questions, and I will try and get through as many as possible for the panel, just uh, tap them into the chat box underneath this live stream. Um, Giles and Frauka, actually, I'm going to come to you both on something that, that Jan raised first off, because I think it's a really important point, and that's that of collaboration and how people can work together. And I just wonder whether you both feel that maybe Jan has a point and there could be more collaboration rather than it being seen a, a battle between one source rather than the other. Frauke, what do you think? Hello, Frauke, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. I a priori, yes, absolute agreement. We need to uh, we need to look across the boundaries, and that's also what I try to express that uh, that there is a need to to fill the gaps of whatever one vector cannot do. Um, nevertheless, I think if we just look at the at the realities uh, of energy technologies of trends in the system. Uh, I would like to come back to the point that I think we need a diversity of vect vectors and solutions, but there is one that's going to be dominant, and that is the one that, that I emphasized. It's, it's the one based on renewables, direct electrification, and flexibility from the power system and from the demand side. Uh, and then there will be various others that will need to be uh, within this line, um, and, and as I mentioned, uh, hydrogen is going to be one of those. Um, possibly other gas-based solutions will be there as well. And we need to look at it very much in an integrated perspective. Um, however, I, I think when having these discussions, there are many angles to it. You could take a political angle trying to somehow uh, yeah, take into consideration all the possible interests um, and get the best mix out of those. Or you could take an economic angle and look at what's cheapest. Or you could look, a sustain look at it from a sustainability angle and look at what is most, uh, what is cleanest. The perspective that I have taken here when I when I did my opening statement was very much from the economic and sustainability angle because I believe that even from a societal and political perspective, if we have these two dimensions covered, then there are a lot of questions of transition and organizing this transition fairly and organizing it well. But in the end, if we have those dimensions covered, the sustainability and the economics, and we manage the transition well, then this is the winning strategy for everyone at the end. Okay, all right, Clara, thank you. Let me bring Giles in on that one. Giles, do you think there could be more collaboration between the different industries and that would actually be positive for all concerned? Or are you quite happy with the level of collaboration and cooperation? The wind industry does not do conflict. We do not do battles. We completely agree with Jan. We need more collaboration. We especially need it on hydrogen, which, remember, is going to be somewhere between 10 and 15% of our energy mix, at least by 2050. Let me give you a specific example. We're developing a project in northern Germany. It will take wind energy from some onshore wind farms in Niedersachsen. It will electrolyze. It will carry renewable hydrogen 140 kilometers down a pipeline to the Ruhr. That renewable hydrogen will feed a BP refinery, an Evonik chemicals plant, and it will be a hydrogen-only pipeline. But Jan, we can only deliver that with the collaboration of your members. Let me just say one other thing about hydrogen. People talk about gray, blue, and renewable hydrogen, where are we on the costs? Yes, renewable hydrogen costs more than blue hydrogen or gray hydrogen today, but those costs are going to come down. The latest Wind Europe estimates on this is that we'll be looking at around uh, uh, 2.2 euros by 2030. I shared these numbers recently with Hydrogen Europe. They told me they were conservative. By the way, 2.2 euros would be in the same ballpark uh, as uh, blue and grey hydrogen by 2030. So renewable hydrogen will be cost competitive by 2030. 
Okay, Giles, thank you. Um, while we're still talking to you actually about this one, Giles, is another point that Jan brought up about infrastructure. Um, and you gave wonderful examples of how heavy industry is now coming to you and saying, OK, we want to build wind farms right next to the factory. But of course, there are lots of competing uses for land and there will always be public opinion about the building of new wind farms. I mean, do you accept that it is fair to say when it comes to the gas industry, the infrastructure is all, already there and it, it's ready to go and there isn't therefore the... Uh, the investment needed either in finance or, or indeed the investment in land needed as well. OK, in most cases, we won't, in fact, be building wind farms right next door to energy intensive factories. In one or two, we might. Um, but, you know, the siting of wind farms is driven by geography, by land availability, by environmental factors, all sorts of other issues. And as I said in, in my opening intervention, in a lot of cases, you know, there'll be a cable, it'll be part of the established electricity uh, networks. There may be virtual connections between the wind farms and factories through PPAs, which are now taking off uh, in a big way. And, you know, where we're talking renewable hydrogen, yes, the gas grids are going to play a role here. People often try and compare the costs of uh, investments in electricity grids with gas grids. But, you know, Jan has been talking about the conversion of existing natural gas pipelines to uh, to carry 100% hydrogen. Of course, that carries a cost, um, and we need to factor that in. Jan, do you want to come back on that one? On the cost side of transportation, yeah, there have been uh, different numbers on this, and, and uh, some of the numbers have been the magnitude of uh, between 10 and 20 percent of, uh, of the cost of building new pipelines. So, so I, I guess it's, uh, it, it will cost money, yes, uh, but compared to newly built uh, and compared to um, long-haul uh, electrical transport, it, it, it will be cheap. So, so I, I mean, for the on the cost side, no doubt, and and I fully agree that the market should decide here, and that's also why it's important that we're we're getting uh, um, uh, signals to the market on uh, not only the energy price but also the the, the carbon content price, and and uh, um, I think and and then in addition to that, I think there is a scale issue that we need to and scale and speed issue that we need to address. In order to progress decarbonization fast, we need to include all tools. There are no silver bullets. There, there are many silver bullets that we need to activate. And uh, um, I mean, just to put it, things into perspective, I'm, I, again, as I started with saying, I have the deep respect on what is going on, on the, in the electricity sector and on re producing renewable electricity. But if you take solar and wind together today, it's less than 5% of the, of the European energy consumption. And uh, taking into account then that um, electricity is, grow, is, is today 20 plus something and has to grow to 50. Um, and all of that needs to be covered by uh, solar and wind more or less. Then we have, there, is a, there are some great challenges in doing that. Uh, speedy enough and uh, to reach the scale and therefore I think we are well, what we're saying on the gas side is that the gas sector being to uh, looking into the decarbonization of the gas sector including blue hydrogen where it represents this speed and volume which together with renewable produced uh, uh, electricity can make us uh, uh, decarbonizing and carbon neutral in 2050 um, and I think, uh, again, here, we, we instead of discussing what is the best and what should we choose, let, let the market choose, let the cost, uh, real cost of uh, decarbonization be visible. And uh, then I, I th I'm sure that uh, we will need both electricity and gas, both electrons and molecules in order to achieve our, our common goal. Okay, Jan, thank you. There are lots of questions coming in for this panel. If um, if you'd like to submit yours, please do so now. Um, a question for, uh, for you, Clara. Um, talking about assessing the infrastructure, 
And who should assess the infrastructure as we go forward as to how much infrastructure, what it is needed for, how it needs to be um, adapted or whatever, but just a whole picture of the infrastructure. Who is best placed to give us a, the good assessment of that? Thank you for the question. Uh, can I just go back to uh, a related point? Uh, uh, that is uh, the um, level playing field uh, uh, in uh, infrastructural investment between uh, electricity and gas. Uh, I agree that we need to make the, uh, the value of the CO2 value visible or the sustainability value visible to the market. And we have to let the market choose. But in order to allow a really technology neutral choice, we have to make sure that from the regulatory side, uh, the choice of an, the energy vector is not influenced by, uh, inefficiently influenced by uh, the cost of transport. Uh, because uh, differences, current differences in the way infrastructures are, um, the cost of infrastructures is applied to uh, users can actually make uh, um, some use of some uh, energy vectors more convenient than others. And first of all, so we have to make sure that when choosing whether to, uh, for example, where to locate uh, the uh, either a power plant or a conversion facility, uh, the, the locational signal is consistent between electricity being close to the electricity grid or being close to the gas grid. And today we don't have a consistent approach between the two sectors. So this is something I think we, we should uh, sort of look in, into. As for the, uh, the um, the, the evaluation of the future investments, what we, we need is to make sure, first of all, that we have independent scenarios so that people, uh, that scenarios are, are prepared uh, looking uh, with a very high level and uh, uh, neutral uh, 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 approach uh, without favoring one vector or the other. So we want an independent uh, uh, subject uh, preparing uh, and, and drafting the scenarios. Of course, when uh, we come to uh, managing and, uh, the system, uh, uh, then it's the system operators that have the final word. When assessing uh, the investment plans, I think uh, our uh, national, national uh, regulators are well placed uh, and uh, at national level and uh, is uh, at uh, European level. So overall, we need to make sure that when we look at the uh, uh, future energy portfolio, we have an, uh, a look that is not biased and uh, uh, we want to make sure that uh, the um, investment plan are coherent. Mm. Clara, thank you. Um, let's let's give a moment to the other panelists and just see if anybody else wants to come back in on Clara's answer on that one. If possible, yes. Please do, Jan. I'd like to as well. Okay. Uh, on, on, on regarding the, the transport impacting uh, the consumer choice, I have to say that um, I have a difficulty understanding that 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 should not be impacting the consumer choice. Of course, it should, uh, and uh, I, I'm aware it it gives different uh, possibilities for for uh, the consumers depending on the their geographical location. But the consequence of not having that part as a, as a part of the consumer choice is that. Uh, you could say that will be inefficient uh, utilization of investments that will be uh, creating unnecessary need of transportation if if uh, the consumers are not paying for it. So so I, I I'm not sure I'm fully following you uh, there, Clara. And then regarding this about the independent scenarios, I think there is a certain guarantee that uh, today already today in the TYDP 2020. Uh, the scenarios are done by uh, ENSOE and ENSO together. So, uh, if 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 the, there should be any any uh, uh, bias there, it will be a balance between electricity and, and, and gas. 
And the next thing is that um, we are also, of course, listening to what is being said, uh, and, and we will propose uh, a TYNDP advisory panel where we invite uh, all stakeholders, all, all relevant stakeholders into this and, and to make sure that we have the, the, right, uh, the right discussions. And then the last point from my side is that, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's of course fine to have the, the NRAs uh, to be a part of a, of a decision process, but in the end, we are depending on some companies doing the investments, both from the funding sides and the, uh, and the uh, actual uh, 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 work related to the investments. And, and it's, it's not the regulators who are spending the money. The regulators have to look after that the, spend, that the money is spending wisely, uh, but they are not the ones spending the money. Thank okay, you. Jan, thank you very much. Um, Giles, I'll let you come back in on that one as well. And then Clara, if you want to clarify at all, but Giles first. Thank you very much, Sasha. I fully agree with Clara on level playing field. There's one area today where we don't have a level playing field and it is in the tax treatment of gas and electricity. You pay much more tax per unit of energy consumption on an electric heat pump than you do on a gas boiler. And this is holding back consumers from switching out of gas boilers into electric heat pumps, and it's wrong. All Second, right, Clara. Oh, sorry, Giles, do continue. No, 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 I'll stop there. Please go back to Clara. Yeah, right, okay. Let's, no, let, let me bring Clara in on, a... on that one. Yeah, sorry, uh, just uh, probably I didn't make myself clear. Sorry, uh, just I give you an example. The, uh, the structure of tariffs for uh, injecting electricity, if you are a producer and you inject electricity in the grid, uh, there is usually, uh, you, you don't pay uh, when you inject in many countries in Europe, when you inject gas in the grid, uh, you pay uh, an entry uh, tariff to inject the gas. That's just an example of uh, different treatment between electricity and gas uh, in, uh, in the tariff structure. So I'm saying that when looking, and, and when you look at the conversion facilities, then you look at uh, something that, uh, first of all, is using, um, is withdrawing, for example, electricity from the grid and then maybe injecting gas so you have a double counting there as well and double counting may be on uh, uh, taxation as well and uh, taxation is another distortion so uh, distortions can work one way or the other and we should uh, sort of identify them and trying to get rid of them in order to have an efficient uh, competition between uh, energy vectors mm -hmm. and how how confident or how comfortable or positive are you that there could be a framework in the future that actually you could sit back and go, yeah, we've come up with something that is the level playing field that we that many say that we need. Uh, I think I'm confident that when you have a real problem, then uh, somebody is going to address it. Maybe now uh, people uh, are not do not perceive this as a real problem yet. Um, but uh, I'm confident that we, we will tackle the issues uh, in, in due time. Okay. Clara, thank you very much. Um, lots of different questions on lots of different issues. Um, let me, Jan, if I may come back to you on this one and then, and, and then we'll, we'll go to Frauke in a moment. But a very specific question for you, Jan, about the gas pipelines being technically upgraded. Now, if I may, if I could ask you not to go into the great technical explanation of this, but just maybe in, in layman's terms, how difficult it is to upgrade a gas pipeline for hydrogen. But actually, if I could ask you about the cost, the cost versus the benefit. Um, first of all, thank you for that. Uh, first of all, just one remark. I'm fully in agreement on the level playing field. So no, let uh, not there be any doubt on that one. Regarding the cost of uh, converting, um, I, I think the numbers that we are seeing for the time being, and, and that is, uh, of course, different depending on the age of the pipeline, depending on the age of the equipment. 
but uh, newer equipment, of course, is is uh, more compatible with uh, with 100% hydrogen or uh, big shares of hydrogen. Um, and uh, but but we are talking about in on the average, and that and I think the, the recent um, publication, the European Hydrogen Backbone. Uh, is talking about, as far as I re remember, between 10 and 20 percent uh, as you, the cost of uh, of converting a, a, a existing ga a gas pipeline. Um, that can that number can probably vary. It can be cheaper for uh, newer pipelines, and we know the pipelines being built today is already uh, 100 percent hydrogen ready. Um, and and maybe more costly for older pipelines, and and maybe they should not then be converted. So I think it's a it's a matter of looking into where do we get uh, the the most efficient conversion. But the the difficulty um, we we still of course are looking into that. I think uh, many of our members are already today doing uh, practical studies on on. Uh, on pipeline systems, pipeline sections, and equipment, compressors, and meters, and uh, yeah, as everything else, it takes a while because you uh, before you have the fully fledged and and uh, and uh, cost reduced solutions. But this is going on right now, and and uh, it will come. It will be uh, uh, an attractive um, uh, uh, opportunity. And uh, again, here. Of course, it will be tested vis-a-vis -vis the alternatives. If there are cheaper alternatives uh, to co to uh, combat the, the carbon emissions, then those alternatives should be uh, promoted. But I'm I'm confident that we will come up with the with the very very competitive solutions. Okay, um, Jan, thank you very much, Prauke. Let me come to you next on on this question, and if anyone else wants to jump in on this too. But it's a question about energy poverty. Um, and obviously we, we all agree that lowering emissions is is, is the goal. Um, but then that could come, this person says, with raising um, finance, raising GDP as well, um, and making sure that actually you've got the cost and the benefit on an equal footing. So I guess my question to you, Clark, um, Frauke, is you know, climate is not just a, an EU or US issue. It is a global issue. So how do you ensure that actually there is the access to sustainable and lowered emission energy, but also that that doesn't break the bank, if I can put it that way? Thank you. That is probably one of the most crucial questions of the entire energy transition, both in Europe and globally. Um, uh, part of the answer is, is the easy part, um, and that is, I think, where we started the discussions of this panel earlier, that if we just look at the cost of the different technologies and the generation, uh, then we already see that in electricity, renewables are the cheapest sources of energy today, and the more we electrify also other energy sectors, um, the more they can also benefit from this uh, cost-effective and clean resource at the same time. Now, of course, that might all sound very theoretical uh, in, in areas where we already have existing power plants, where we already have existing systems in place, um, especially also in other parts of the world. And here, I think, is a very important role for Europe um, to, first of all, pave the way and show the way forward by making the transition happen in Europe and making it a just transition in Europe. Because if it technically okay. makes sense and is affordable, then it's just a question of the distributional impacts beyond and behind. And that I think is, is an enormous challenge that Clara and her colleagues are having to face, but also beyond that our entire political system has to face on how we manage the transition in a just manner. Because if it makes sense on a macroeconomic scale, it still needs to be uh, promoted and done in a fair way. Um, mm. And if Europe manages that, uh, then the world can too, with further challenges involved um, and with further dimensions to be considered. But the, the fact remains the same. Renewables are already, in many cases, the most cost-effective solutions or are on the way of getting there in Europe and around the world. 
Um, yeah, and let me come to you on, on a final one on that one, because we've heard so much about cost. I mean, yes, emissions lowering, but it being done in conjunction with cost. And I, I just wondered what you might want to add to that one. I, I would like to add that uh, it, I think it's important to uh, to uh, cover the full uh, value chain uh, in in the in the equation here, and and it's uh, I mean I can only welcome uh, that that renewable electricity is coming down in cost, but we do also need to include that uh, the intermittency and the, not only the short term flexibility but also the seasonality um, and um, the the uh, if you are including uh, the pressing cost of uh, electricity storage, meaning batteries mainly, then again here uh, hydrogen may uh, turn up as the most competitive option. So again here, I would like to say I'm fully aligned with the um, aiming for a level playing field. I'm fully aligned that we should uh, make the cost. Uh, visible and and uh, transparent, and I think and that does include the carbon cost. Um, in, in so we get a, we get we, we present we'll be able to present the consumers for the real choice, uh, also the real economic choice, reflecting the real costs. So I, I, that, that would be yes. okay. Yeah, and thank you very much. And actually. That, uh, that leads us very nicely on, actually, to our second panel, which will start in about 10 minutes from now, when we will be looking at how to ensure that the Green Deal works for consumers and for industry and how everybody can get what is needed out of it. So that's coming up in a, a little bit. But it just leads me to say, sadly, we are out of time on our first panel this afternoon. May I thank all of you very much for your thoughts and your opinions and actually the time you've given us as well. So wherever you are sitting at the moment, thank you for uh, making us part of your afternoon. Jan and Frauke, Clara and Giles, thank you all very much. And thank you to you for submitting all the questions. We tried to get through as many as possible. Um, do be ready to submit more for the second panel this afternoon. So we'll be talking about uh, consumers and industry and uh, a great green deal for all. That's coming up in 10 minutes from now. So a quick break. Feel free to... Uh, Maybe put the kettle on if you are working from home. Grab yourself a quick cup of tea. Uh, we'll see you back here at 1700, five o'clock, uh, Brussels time. Uh, and in the meantime, of course, it is Eurogas's 30th anniversary. And so, as I'm sure you would expect, we've been around the industry to chat to a few people to see what the future, maybe the next 30 years might hold. So enjoy this and we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you. Happy anniversary, Eurogas. Thank you so much for your work and thank you very much for our extraordinary collaboration of these years. We are facing many challenges, including decarbonization. And you know very well that I strongly believe that uh, the transition to a more sustainable economic and social environment cannot succeed without the use of gas. Congratulations for your first 30 years. Our energy system has changed enormously in this period. In the next 30 years, changes will be even more abrupt. Gas will represent a crucial bridge towards climate neutrality. You have uh, served very well the gas industry, the business uh, over the last 30 years. You can be proud of your, your achievements there. Congratulations. Now, you are needed uh, more than ever because the gas sector is uh, ahead of its biggest uh, challenge and this is the decarbonization of gas. I wish you um, big success in completing uh, and working on this uh, task because it is uh, of key interest uh, to all of us. 30 years of achievements, long way, with definitely well recognized and great results. We were working together for so many years on different topics related to the important role of the gas industry. The key question is how to accelerate the transition. 
Of course, it is important to upgrade the existing gas infrastructure, but it is also important to provide adequate funding for research and innovation. In this regard, we have to work together with a realistic approach, taking into account that we need to secure our energy supply and at the same time to provide affordable energy for the consumers and the industry. Gas networks have a tremendous potential to store and integrate renewable energy. The next 30 years will be critical in delivering carbon neutrality. It's our belief that Eurogas has a key role in playing and shaping an ambitious future towards carbon neutrality. Industrial Europe and its 190 member organizations congratulate Eurogas for this anniversary. Together, we have an important role to play in fostering a just transition, not only for the current workers in the gas sector, but also for the sectors downstream the value chain, including energy intensive industry. Congratulations to Eurogas on the 30th anniversary. 30 years is a long time. Many great people that have gone through the company in that time made a huge contribution to society. Technologies will change, things will develop, and innovation, and your guests are well able to do that. And uh, here's to the next 30 years, and happy birthday. Happy anniversary. We are very proud of you, Eurogas. Renewable hydrogen. It's the cleanest form of hydrogen. And it's based on renewables, the cheapest form of energy. What's more, it'll be made in Europe. We work together towards a common goal of carbon neutrality for buildings in 2050. So I take this opportunity to thank you for the nice cooperation and to wish you a very happy anniversary. We at EBA hope that over the next 30 years, Eurogas will continue paving the way for a sustainable and flexible European gas market, enabling full uptake of renewable gases. Gas will need to be a cornerstone of the European integrated and climate neutral energy market. In the last 30 years, you have been shaping the energy discussions in Brussels, in Europe and beyond. In 30 years, it will be 2050 and we will all be living in a renewable and climate neutral Europe. Happy birthday once again. Looking ahead, SEER believes that decarbonized gases should be able to be integrated into existing gas markets with full valuation of their environmental benefits. Regulators look forward to working with those in the gas industry towards achieving a carbon neutral EU in 2050. Thank you. I expect that the EU will need um, gaseous fuels uh, for the next 30 years, uh, but of course the the challenge of both CO2 and methane emissions will have to be tackled um, and, and we remain, we in the Environmental Defence Fund, um, remain open to keep the conversation with Eurogas and its members to make sure that we have the policies and, and the innovations that will make the urbanisation of industry work. Congratulations with the 30. We look forward to working with you in the next 30 years and to celebrating the 60th anniversary in 2050 when you've become a fully carbon neutral energy vector. But today, my main message to Eurogas is to contribute to decarbonization. And I am confident with the leadership of Eurogas to boost innovation, all technologies in order to adapt gas infrastructure, to develop hydrogen and methanization to produce gas renewables. Congratulations with the 30 year anniversary. We share the ambitions and the visions of a decarbonized gas sector by 2050. It will be a challenging and interesting journey and I'm sure that Eurogas and ENSOC will play important roles and have good corporations in achieving uh, this result. Please continue to be professional, innovative and open. You are standing in front of one of the biggest challenges in your history, gas sector decarbonization. You started early and embraced the change. Smart sector integration, hydrogen and biomethane are part of the response. 30 years, wow. Looking back, I think uh, you can be very proud of what you have achieved. I wish you a lot of courage and also very brilliant and innovative ideas so that uh, you can uh, be a very active part of this long-term journey as you have been uh, such an active part uh, over the last 30 years. If Eurogas 
wants to be part of the future, Eurogas will have to transform very quickly. So I would like to see Eurogas heavily turning towards renewable fuel, being a leader on hydrogen technology and phasing out fossil gas as soon as possible. Go for it. Thanks. Gas has a role to play in our sustainable development scenario. We see the benefits in particular in heat, in industry, in winter heat, in buildings, particularly in Europe, but also as a flexibility backup for renewables. As Europe is building up the net zero future for 2050, these benefits for gas needs to be without emissions. So there are some new technologies, CCS, CCU, but also biomethane, hydrogen and others. From a renewables perspective, Aerogas will have a very big and exciting task ahead. Biogas, renewable synthetic gases and renewable hydrogen are some of the most exciting new opportunities that are rapidly emerging in, uh, uh, in Europe and will definitely shape our energy system. I think that Eurogas will play a critical role in this by bringing together existing but also uh, new stakeholders around our common vision of a climate neutral Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second half of the Eurogas annual conference where we're discussing is there a single pathway to 2050 or are there lots of different ways of getting to our objectives of carbon neutrality. We've had a great first half, a great panel with some really interesting insights and some great ideas that are being put around. A good discussion, healthy discussion, uh, but obviously a lot of ideas around cooperation. One of the things that has been picked up on today is the idea that in Europe we can do a lot of things that will really help uh, make this transition something that the European people can be very proud of and own. And I think that's a very important level of making sure that we will be able to get that just transition that we need. In Eurogas, we believe very strongly that we should support the European companies who are making the technologies that will deliver on the decarbonized and renewable future that we all badly want to see happen in the next 30 years. We're bringing forward a video now that will explain to you some of the technologies that are made here in Europe for Europeans 
that relate to the gas sector that will actually help us get the hydrogen, the biomethane, and all of the other gaseous fuels that we need for the next 30 years brought to you, the customer, made for you in the EU. European industry has proven it can lead and change. Today, Europe leads the way in becoming carbon neutral and gas technologies will be key to this. These technologies will help Europe meet ambitious decarbonisation goals and stay competitive on the global market. Gas technologies can store energy made from renewable sources, turn agricultural waste into energy, cut emissions from our buildings, and make transportation more sustainable, saving European citizens 4.1 trillion euro by 2050, using innovations along with infrastructure and energy sources we already have. European companies are global leaders in decarbonisation technologies which can help manufacturing and industry reduce emissions whilst keeping European products competitive. Take electrolyzers. Using excess electricity from renewables to create hydrogen, electrolyzers can decarbonise our transport, buildings and manufacturing. Or anaerobic digesters. These capture agricultural waste and create valuable energy sources like biomethane which can be used in our gas grids. Then there is carbon capture and storage, which captures CO2 emissions and stores them underground where they came from. It's nicknamed CCS. New types of CCS are being developed. For example, pyrolysis, which cracks methane. It separates the hydrogen and leaves solid black carbon instead of emissions. Clever, no? Finally, our global trade is great, but heavy emissions come from the shipping sector. New engine technologies for ships allow them to use liquefied natural gas, or LNG, reducing the footprints of our parcels. Designed, manufactured and deployed in the EU, gas technologies can provide jobs here in Europe. Jobs that will bring the next generation of Europeans new skills, new employment and a whole new industry built around the production distribution and maintenance of clean gas technologies. And of course, just as the gas technologies can help Europe to decarbonise, they can also help countries around the world to meet their own climate goals. This gives European gas technologies enormous export potential. As the global climate leader, the EU should support the development of these technologies, recognise their potential and be proud of European innovation. After all, they are made here for EU. Ladies and gentlemen, you had a quick insight there to some of the great technologies we have in the gas sector that are being made and built here in Europe, being deployed in Europe, and indeed we can see those exported across the world. This is going to be a huge opportunity for us. In Eurogas, in the next couple of months, we're going to be having a series of gas tech talks where experts from the industry are going to be coming online, talking with a respected journalist about their individual company's experiences and what they need to see them taking their role as global exporters. Stick with us for that, because that's something you really have to get a, get a hold on, because that's really going to make a big difference to the way the energy transition will develop in Europe. But for now, I'm happy to be passing back uh, to Sasha, who will be taking us through a panel where indeed we'll be looking at the experience of industry and consumers in relation uh, to the ideas that we've heard discussed in the first panel about how we get to 2050 with all these new products. Uh, and I think someone said without costing the earth, I think we were saying something like this is costing the earth and uh, we certainly want to make sure that we're not going to be doing that. So Sasha, please take us through panel number two, steer us through those choppy waters of discussion. We're looking forward to it. Absolutely, James, thank you very much. Indeed, it is about talking about what works for everybody, what works for consumers and for industry as well. As you say, we've already heard some of the possibilities for 2030 and 2050, but actually let's now uh, look at, at how this could happen and what it might actually feel like. Um, so I'm very pleased to say that we have four panellists again joining us for uh, our second discussion. So please welcome 
Uh, first of all, we have Andreas Graf, who's the project manager at EU Energy Policy at the Energy Transition Think Tank, Angora Energy Wind. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Andreas. Uh, Paul Voss, who is the managing director of Euro Heat and Power. Hello, Paul. Thank you again for joining us. Nicola Riga, the Climate Change and Energy Director at CEPI, which is the European Association representing the paper industry. And Monique Goyens, the uh, Director General of Berk, defending the interests of European consumers. Monique, I am sure we're going to be uh, hearing a lot about uh, consumers, what they want, what their needs are, and actually how best to meet them. Uh, not costing the earth and not breaking the bank, I think are definitely two phrases for this afternoon. Now, as we did in our first panel, first of all, feel free to send questions at any time. This is definitely a two-way street. We may not be in the same room but absolutely I want to hear from you so again if you think of a question as soon as you think of it tap it into the chat box just below the live broadcast and as in the first panel we've asked all four of our panelists to lay out their thoughts and their visions and talk about a green deal that works for consumers and for industry so in no particular order but if I could start with Andreas please Andreas Graf over to you. There we go. You should hear me now. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so thank you for inviting me to this uh, to this conversation uh, about um, how the EU Green Deal can work for households and consumers. And I, I thought I would just, you know, with the Commission coming out with its impact assessment on the European Green Deal just, uh, you know, um, a few days ago, so to say, still, um, I thought I would just provide some thoughts on what we have learned from that impact assessment and what we have not learned and where we still need to have uh, a deeper conversation and maybe one that we can have today. So first of all, what did the impact assessment on the European, uh, of the European Commission tell us about uh, achieving a minus 55% target? Well, first of all, uh, quite clearly it said it is possible to achieve a higher climate target of minus 55% and we should go for it. So, uh, you know, uh, we have had a conversation over the last year about whether um, higher ambition is something Europe should go for. Uh, and uh, in quite uh, deep analysis over 400 pages, they come to the clear conclusion that uh, we should be doing it. And, um, and regardless of how you view the decision of the European Commission to also include LULUCF in the calculation of a minus 55% target, I think one can say uh, that the decision of Commission President Ursula von der Leyen to strongly back such a target uh, is, is showing that she's delivering on her uh, ambition to really uh, raise uh, climate ambition in the 2030 timeframe. Secondly, I think uh, a clear message from the impact assessment is that all sectors will have to contribute to achieving emissions reductions in line with the minus 55% target. If you look at the um, modeling of the European Commission, uh, a lot of the emissions reductions come from the power sector and from the building sector. Uh, in fact, if you uh, accumulate the, uh, the absolute emissions reductions in those two, those two sectors, they make up about two thirds of the emissions reductions in this time frame from 2015. Uh, which is the kind of the base year in the assessment to 2030. Um, so, you know, we're talking about uh, massive uh, reductions in those two sectors in particular. However, um, also industry, also uh, transport sector make significant contributions to a minus 55% target. So all sectors will have to contribute. And the commission is quite clear in saying we will have to uh, revise the climate policy architecture in this context, revise the UETS, revise the effort sharing regulation, revise uh, LULUCF. Um, and so, um, and then third, I think quite clearly in the impact assessment, we hear that a strong climate or a strong policy mix will be needed to deliver uh, ambition at this scale. So um, what the commission impact assessment does is it, it breaks, I think partially also the false dichotomy between regulation and CO2 pricing. Across Europe today, we already see that CO2 pricing is applied in many member states across uh, almost all sectors. We clearly already see it, see it applied in the EU ETS, and we also see regulations delivering significant emissions reductions in all sectors. Now, what they, the Commission does in its, in its modeling uh, scenario framework is it also set, asks the question, in delivering more ambition, 
do we want to do this more with uh, CO2 pricing or with regulation, but with, regardless of the conclusion on CO2 pricing, we will need to have a strong regulatory framework and we will need to have a strong policy mix to actually deliver uh, on, on these targets. And finally, I think what the Commission very strongly says in its impact assessment is that increasing ambition is manageable from a macroeconomic perspective. So um, on the one hand, uh, the scale of investment uh, is large, but in the broad scheme of things, when it comes to energy system costs, it is manageable. And on the other hand, from a macroeconomic perspective, when it comes to impacts on GDP, on employment, on sectoral investment, we can manage this scale of ambition um, and uh, it is achievable. Uh, but also in this context, uh, the impact assessment does not necessarily provide enough detail on the concrete impacts on households, on the concrete impacts on industry, depending on what choices we make in trying to get there. So uh, quite clearly, the impact assessment provides a, a kind of a, a strong uh, overview of what it would mean to, to uh, apply different policy um, choices, get to 55%. But uh, when it comes to distributional questions, for example, uh, on, on carbon leakage protection for industry, um, we don't have clear answers, but rather most of the assessment is kind of deferred for an impact assessment in the, uh, accompanying the upcoming border carbon adjustment. When it comes to investment, um, we hear in the, in the um, impact assessment, for example, for industry that uh, many of the investments we will need for a climate neutral industry cannot be delivered at CO2 prices that are found in the impact assessment and that there will need to be an enabling framework to deliver those investments. But we don't hear the concrete proposals of what those enabling frameworks are going to be in the future or how we're going to make sure that those uh, investments still take place. But we need greater clarity on those. And I think uh, this is not a criticism of the commission. I think this is this is the natural progress of uh, the process in which we will have this conversation around higher ambition. We, we have a, a clear signal that we should be doing higher ambition, that we will revise um, legislation in the upcoming months to get there. And in that process, we will have a conversation about how to manage some of these distributional questions and how to make sure that the investments actually take place. Andreas, thank you very much. Um, you, you've opened out with some, uh, some great points there. Remember, if you'd like to ask Andreas anything directly or indeed share your opinion, do fill in the chat box just underneath this live broadcast. Um, let's bring in Paul now, Paul Voss from Euroheat and Power. Paul. Ah, Paul, I don't think we can hear you properly. Do you have your microphone Plastic. muted? There we yeah. go. There's, there's always going to be another one. Of course I'm there. muted. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Good. Uh, fine. Uh, thank you. And and uh, a, a few things for me. Uh, first of all, on, on, on the heating sector. So I, I represent the district heating and cooling industry. So we're very concerned with, with thermal energy supply. And I think it's worth recalling because it probably still doesn't get said enough. Heat is half of the energy that we use in Europe. So this really is a big deal. And to talk about consumers, I mean, it's hard to think of anything more fundamental, at least energy-wise, uh, to people's daily lives and meeting this, this basic need to, to keep ourselves warm or cool, as the case may be at home. So it, it really is enormously important. And if you just look at the numbers, I mean, there can't be any energy transition unless you get uh, a fundamental uh, reorganization of the, the heating and cooling sector. Now, the reason we need so much change is because the current state isn't really ideal. We have a small number of member states where this is already uh, quite well advanced, often, but not always in, in, in markets where you have a lot of district heating networks. But that's not really the point. The bigger point is that in a lot of member states, we still just burn oil and gas uh, for heat in our homes. And I'm sure many of us here live in, in Belgium. I live in Brussels. And I can tell you, um, I really, really struggle to find any other solution. We renovated a house last year. And I went to a lot of trouble just trying to find an installer who would come and talk to me about what I consider to be a sustainable heat supply solution. It was almost impossible. In the end, I called my colleagues from the heat pump sector and said, guys, this is getting a bit awkward and embarrassing. I can't find a heat pump salesman. Uh, and they were good enough to help me uh, find somebody who came to my house, had a good look around. 
and said, we can install a heat pump in your back garden. It's going to cost 23,000 euros. And I said, okay, well, look, fine. This is a family home. We're going to live here for ages. So let's talk payback periods. And uh, I'm reminded of something Giles uh, Dixon said in the last panel. You know, the heat pump salesman laughed and said, you will spend more money on electricity for the heat pump than you would on gas for the boiler. So it's not that there's a long or slow payback period that there isn't one. And that's a lot to do with, of course, heat pumps uh, are at this stage still relatively expensive. And I guess those prices will come down, but a lot of it is tax. Uh, and, and, and that's a real problem for, for, for a family. I mean, 23,000 euros buys an awfully nice kitchen and it's hard to get excited about heat supply. You know, you just want to be warm and, and, and that's sort of the end of it. So the, the, the current state of play is not good. Now, the EU has done a good job, I think, in the last few years of beginning to talk about this, make the problem explicit and start to, to try and address it through legislation. Um, but one of the difficulties that we face and that we all face, I think, is that the EU's institutional architecture and, and legal architecture is essentially preconditioned to solve problems either by resorting to electricity or to gas, because those are the pillars of the internal energy market. And the problem with that is that heat is, in the end, quite a local issue. And you can get a gap between what looks like sensible policy from a very high level and what looks um, appropriate to local level energy planners, city planners, deputy mayors working on these things. Um, so one of the things that I think is really important is that we, we, we start to have much more um, dialogue um, of both on the policy level, but also infrastructure planning, so that local realities match up with the solutions that we may be designing here in, in Brussels. And finally, on district heating and cooling, um, you know, we've got to fit into all this. So if you look at district heating today, I mean, there are countries, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and others, where it's already largely renewable and highly efficient, and it's kind of all fine. They still have steps to take, but we talk about full carbon neutrality by 2025 or 2030. Um, but there are other markets where, uh, like electricity, uh, it's still dominated by fossil fuels. Um, that, that needs to change and is changing. And what we see is a kind of multi-energy energy future emerging where individual systems are fed by a combination of local renewables, can be electricity from the grid, uh, can be geothermal or solar thermal or biomass. And that brings me to gas. Um, right now, we use lots and lots of gas in different markets for district heating networks. Um, we have committed to full carbon neutrality by 2050, and that means either the gas gets replaced by something else or the gas turns green. Uh, and as I'm always saying to James, um, you know, if Europe's going to have green gas available, please do give it either to industry for high temperature applications or to us so that we can generate heat and power with it on a large scale. But my sense is it's best kept out of tiny boilers uh, because actually renewable gas is a, is, a, is a precious resource that can do all sorts of exciting things more than just uh, giving us room temperature heat. And if we do all these things properly, then I think consumers uh, can only stand to, to win from an energy transition that is as thoughtfully organized as possible. I think I'll leave it there. Paul, thank you very much for some interesting points. And again, anything that you'd like to come back on, please do type your, your questions into the chat box. Um, Nicola, Nicola Riga from CEPI, um, your thoughts on what the Green Deal should or could deliver for EU customers and for industry, particularly for you as well? Yes, good afternoon, and uh, thanks, uh, Eurogas, for the invitation, and also for my start, congratulations for the 30 years anniversary. Um, just a few words on CEPI, European pulp and paper industry, for the ones who are not familiar. From an energy perspective, we are the fourth largest industrial energy consumer in Europe. We consume uh, 11 billion cubic meters of natural gas, which is uh, something uh, about 10% of uh, industrial, uh, total industrial consumption of gas. And for the ones who think in more in energy uh, numbers, it's about 160 terawatt hours. We are responsible for less than 1% of EU carbon emissions, um, and uh, we think we have a, role, a key role to play in, in uh, helping Europe reach 2050 carbon neutrality target, both by reducing our carbon footprint and by replacing the carbon intensive products. Now, when it comes to the Green Deal and uh, the time scale for uh, industrial investments, just a few uh, thoughts to contextualize the challenge. Um, from 2025 onwards, I would say that every year that goes by, the, the, the chances of having uh, 
investment made in, from there onwards uh, uh, to, to, stay, to stay until 2050, it's exponentially, exponentially growing. And that's because these uh, investments are meant to, to be there for uh, 20 years or more. Um, at the same time, uh, uh, to deliver on the 2030 horizon, uh, investment decision needs to happen uh, at the latest in the next two to three years. And that's because of the, the whole follow-up in terms of uh, uh, environmental permits, uh, uh, constructions, and so forth. That means that the window of opportunity for making what I would say the right investment decision is extremely small. And uh, we are going through uh, situations which are not making it uh, any easier. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis is still ongoing, which is uh, weakening balance sheets and uh, is also creating low demand. Um, and we're living in times of great uncertainties when it comes to the economic, political, and social uh, situations. So um, this to be said, this, this being said, uh, um, uh, investments in industries are important, uh, and uh, um, they, to, 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 for, for those investments to happen, the industry needs to be competitive, so that that would enable industry to, to step forward and invest. Um, most of the carbon emissions in industry come from combustion of fuels. Uh, in our case, it's for sure it's almost entirely, but I think it's, it's a fair share of, of uh, all industrial emissions uh, coming from, from combustion fuels. And uh, uh, definitely energy efficiency will continue to play an important role, and uh, we are uh, uh, definitely uh, strongly committed to do that. Um, it, it's a core of our business. Um, yet, ultimately, uh, energy will still be needed, and uh, this energy needs to be carbon neutral and needs to be cost competitive. So when it comes to the decarbonization of the energy system, uh, uh, that needs to happen at least cost. And for me, the concept of least cost has uh, three dimensions. The first one is the cost of uh, producing uh, energy. That applies for both the production of, of each unit of energy, cost of production, but also on, on the scale and availability. Because of course, if uh, is cheap but not available, then uh, the demand and supply play an important role in, in defining the cost. Second element in terms of least cost uh, is the cost of delivering that energy to the end user, so the infrastructure costs which are associated to that. And the third element is the cost of adaptation from the end user perspective, because that also has, has an impact. And uh, as an industry, we are uh, well positioned in terms of uh, doing some arbitrage between uh, different uh, energy uh, costs, but yet we need to be placed also in a position to have these uh, energy uh, vectors to compete with each other, otherwise there is no market. Um, my last uh, three messages I'd like to, 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 to leave for the moment before going to the discussion is that uh, first we need clarity on where the energy costs are going. Uh, and uh, to be honest, uh, looking at uh, uh, the 2013 impact assessment, uh, the figures that I saw, they're not particularly encouraging, both in, term both in terms of cost and volumes. Uh, secondly, uh, I think we need a real uh, and clear roadmap in terms of uh, energy uh, decarbonization uh, that will bring us from today to tomorrow, which enables industry to plan and adapt accordingly. And thirdly, uh, I'd like to bring back a concept which sometimes is, is being thrown in these discussions of the uh, famous intertemporal efficiency. Meaning, uh, if uh, cost, energy costs are higher today, but somehow are expected to be lower tomorrow, then I think there is some logic in uh, support industry for early uptake of low carbon energy sources. I'll leave it there and I'm happy to follow up on the discussion afterwards. Nicola, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. And uh, you also mentioned the, the COVID-19 situation and how that's impacted not only on industry and consumers, but actually I think we'll talk more about in a moment um, how maybe in energy use has changed and could also continue to change for consumers in the future as well. Um, but let me now bring in Monique Goyens from Burke, defending the interests of European consumers. Monique, over to you. What, what do consumers need and, and how, how do we get a good deal for them. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be able to share with you the competitive perspective on, uh, on uh, the energy transition and the Green Deal. And what I would like to say is really uh, consumers are key if you want 
the climate transition, and I say climate transition, to be a success. And it's not only about heating and cooling. It is about changing your lifestyle in the way you eat, the way you move, the way you travel, the way you heat and cool your house, the way you, you, you buy or don't buy products, the way you dispose of them. So it's quite a challenge for people because they are the ones to make it happen. If the people are not going to make it happen, you won't have a successful green deal uh, and climate transition. So that's the price to pay. That means that any ambitious energy policy that wants to tackle the energy challenges and the energy transition needs to put the consumer at the center. Now, this is a little bit verbal EU verbal language, but when you hear, and we didn't coordinate that, but when you hear Paul speaking about how he struggles to get a heat pump in his house, he is, Paul is an energy expert. Can you imagine what, have, what happens to, can I say, normal people? who don't even have a clue about heat pumps, who don't know who, to, who is the trustworthy person uh, to, to, to turn to. And, and this is really something that is, uh, it's very practical, it's very concrete, but people are struggling with understanding what's, um, what's happening to them. And that's one of the policy responses that needs to be brought. And I would like to share three, uh, three ideas with you. Uh, first of all, uh, of course, energy is going to be more and more expensive uh, for people. And, uh, this is even more um, uh, problematic that we have still uh, 50 million people who are in energy poverty. It's, uh, they need to choose between heating and eating. And that means that also we need to provide uh, solutions that are also uh, acceptable for the less affluent households. And um, in that context, we believe in order to be able to cope with the energy bill, the energy bill uh, should be lower than uh, more expensive than higher. And that means that you need to invest into energy efficiency of buildings. And therefore, we really think that the renovation wave should be designed in such a way that an, uh, investments into energy efficiency, so renovation, retrofitting of housing, uh, trickles down to the private households so that it can is made uh, affordable for the less affluent households to invest in heat pumps or to invest in solar panels or in any other, uh, let's say, solution that is uh, more energy efficient. And can I say, Paul, if you combine your heat pump with solar panels and you get collective purchasing to get that at a lower price, it might be already something that could be acceptable and even return on investment during your lifetime. So this is the type of thing that should be, that should be certainly uh, promoted. But uh, not, so you have the price is a made, the cost upfront cost is a major barrier, not only for poor consumers, but also for more affluent households. But it's also, as, as already mentioned, the lack of information that is available, the lack of independent advice. Who is going to tell you whether you, in your house, you can put a heat pump uh, at, at, uh, with a return on investment probability? Who is going to tell you that you should rather that you can wait for district heating rather than uh, investing into an individual um, uh, heat pump? Uh, can you trust the installer is that a professional who you can trust that is doing the right job for you so this is the, these are all uh, let's say accompanying measures that need to be uh, helping the consumer second second reflection and that's a little bit underestimated for the moment from the consumer perspective is the timing of the rollout of the decarbonization strategy because if you decarbonize heating for consumers that means you need to adapt your devices and when you buy a heating device or cooling, uh, you buy that for maybe not your lifetime, but certainly for 20 or 30 years. That's what you think. Now, if you change the system, you, you need to uh, adapt it, adapting devices or even new devices. And this is something where people should be warned about, warned about because uh, if I buy today um, a heating device that is not fit for purpose anymore in 10 years time, I really would feel frustrated. And please, prevent frustration by people because then you lose their trust. So it should be built into the system and into the transition that people can um, adapt their existing devices by, by the low cost solutions, for example. Another uh, timing uh, issue is that of uh, infrastructure. Uh, so if there is a planning of uh, rolling out district heating, for example, in a certain area, people should be warned very early about that because then they could maybe decide to wait for some uh, individual investments, uh, because if they know afterwards that there is the district heating made available in the neighborhood, it would be really, again, uh, a, a lost investment. And that's something that should certainly uh, be uh, as minimal as, as, uh, as possible. 
And the last point I would like to make is, uh, is the fact that uh, you need the sustainable solution to be the, the easy one, the simple one, the affordable, not only the affordable one, but also the simple one, meaning that a green tariff, when somebody is being sold a green tariff, it must be really a green tariff, meaning that there must be an additional environmental benefit uh, for, for the consumer to take up that, uh, that uh, type of uh, offer. And also, um, certainly when it comes to gas, uh, I think that it is, people are not, don't have a PhD in chemistry, so a blue, green, whatever the color of the hydrogen or whatever the source of the, um, uh, the type of gas, this is much too complicated uh, for, for consumers. And it is very important that the communication around, um, let's say, uh, the new hydrogen, for example, uh, is, is very cautious and doesn't mislead consumers about the, indeed the, uh, the environmental uh, uh, consequences of the, using that, that type of uh, hydrogen. That's all that I wanted to say for the moment. Thank you very much. Monique, thank you very much. You have given us so much there, talking about retrofitting the lifetime of appliances. Um, and actually another point as well, that if you, as a householder, and let's go back to, to Paul's example of the heat pump, as a householder, if you are thinking of investing your 23,000 euros or whatever it might be, that's actually investing into your property. Now, Paul said he was going to stay there for quite a while. That may not be the case. You might be in, in a home for, for five, six years. You might be able to accept the cost of a boiler, but maybe not the 23,000 euros. Now, we're obviously using that as an example for, for consumers, but the same idea will also apply when we look across industry as well. And how do you know right now that the decisions you're taking on the infrastructure are the ones that are right for the future. And I'm talking about are going to be supported, will work, will we'll work with other industries, will be the ones that will therefore be supported either by regulation or policies or indeed by consumers in the future. So let's, as a very general question, and from your own point of view, if you could all try to answer this one for me, how do you ensure that what you are doing now for your particular area, whether it's consumers or industry or, or as a whole, is fit for purpose and will actually give you that, that, that cost benefit and the benefit of, of the sustainability as well. So, Monique, I'll come to you last on that one. And I have a feeling you might say education. Um, but Andreas, let me come to you first. I mean, how do you ensure the industry and consumers make the right decisions now for the future? Right. So uh, how do we make uh, provide the framework for industry yeah. and consumers to really thrive in a, in a Green Deal environment? I think uh, the, the picture is quite different for uh, industry and households. And, and just to maybe take the example uh, with the heat pump, um, it, even if, if Paul uh, leaves his home in six years, it, it, um, ideally, he will have made an investment that will also be one that will be suitable for the person purchasing his home, and his home has not burned down and completely lost its value. Um, so uh, hopefully there is still an asset there um, that someone else will be benefit from. And so the question is now, um, you know, is the investment being made today one that is then also for the, the next tenant? It's not simply a question of um, is the value one that has payoff in the immediate future for Paul. Uh, and so let's be clear about that. Um, and, 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 and so in, for the example of, a, of an investment of a household, um, it's, it's, you know, there are different ways to provide this signaling information that, that, that Monique has, has mentioned, you know, let's not disappoint households, let's not get them locked into investment that they'll be unhappy with. Um, you know, one, one of the clear ones could be have a regulatory information of a ban for specific types of, of, uh, of heating appliances, for example. So to say, this is the type of appliance that is no longer fit for, uh, for the climate neutral future that we're moving into, um, I think that's quite a clear signal to households of what they shouldn't be investing in. Um, we could provide them just soft information and say, here's a, here's, a, here's a flyer that says, you know, maybe you shouldn't invest in this. Um, I, I wonder which one will be clear. Now, there are other softer in, in the intermediate forms of providing information. One is to provide incentives, clear incentives uh, on to make 
uh, investing in, in um, a heat pump cheaper for the household, so actually providing a signal by providing the incentive to, to invest in the, in the, and make the right choice. Um, and the other is actually CO2 pricing. So CO2 pricing is a signal to the consumer that the investment is less uh, affordable over time, uh, especially if they know have a clear price trajectory of where the CO2 uh, of CO2 tax, for example, would go over time. So all of those different instruments, for me, are ways to signal um, to the consumer, um, and all of them have uh, their advantages and disadvantages, and um, will be more or less um, appealing to to the regulator. Uh, and we can get into the the, the details, um, but I think I would leave it at that for households and for industry. I think. Uh, we, we really have very different pictures in, in industry. I think the biggest opportunity right now is, is, is that we have major investment cycles um, in the coming decade where um, things like a, a, you know, a blast furnace is, is reaching the end of its, of its lifetime and where we now have a decision to make of whether this blast furnace will no longer be operating in, uh, I mean, whether the steel manufacturing will no longer be operating in Europe, whether we will be replacing uh, a conventional technology with the same conventional technology, making the mistake of locking in a, a very carbon intensive investment, or whether we provide an investment framework to make sure that we, you know, as, as um, Nicola was saying with intertemporal efficiency, whether we actually are making sure that kind of the investments we need for the future are being made today despite the price signals not being there yet. And, and um, you know, Agora has, has come out with a lot of uh, proposals, at least specifically for, uh, for, for example, for the steel sector on what type of policy instruments could be put in place to, on the one hand, make sure those investment, that investment cycle is captured. And on the other hand, we um, also still have a robust framework with regards to carbon leakage. And, and I think that conversation will be ongoing uh, as the commission uh, makes its own proposals. Okay, um, Paul, I'll come back to you in a moment because your your heat pump is now obviously very famous. Um, but actually, let me come to Nicola first on this one because Andreas finished by talking about industry and what industry needs when those big investments are are, are being made. So, give us your thoughts on that one. What what sort of framework? And how does industry know in which direction to go? And actually, how difficult is it for industry to to decide of where they are going to go and make sure that it is going to work and is going to be compatible and is actually the right decision? Uh, um, it's not easy at all, obviously. <laughs> um, the, the issue is, first of all, um, I think it's, it's important to, to stress that um, I'm speaking uh, um, uh, as representative of, of an energy intensive industry. Um, industry, the concept as such, is, is quite large. Um, in energy intensive industries, um, clearly there is a, an important focus on, on energy, and it's, it's, a, it's a crucial issue, it's a core element. So there is a lot of attention in, 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 in uh, how to manage it. Um, investments uh, are uh, usually uh, capex uh, uh, intensive, and uh, and that's where there is a lot of of, of uh, um, consciousness uh, and uh, and uh, quite some uh, um, it's, it's, it's uh, I would say a risk adverse environment in which uh, companies are operating. Um, Companies are, are quite good in managing uh, a risk if they can control it. Um, so it's uh, something which is linked with uh, their own operations, something which is linked with, uh, with uh, understanding the market in which they operate. Um, uh, it is much more complicated to manage risks when uh, those are happening outside of the fence and outside of, uh, outside of the industry fence and outside of the, the, their market of competence. And I'm, I'm talking now mostly about the energy uh, market and energy development. Um, there, it, it is extremely difficult nowadays to have an understanding of what's going to happen uh, with uh, um, energy prices, uh, so, sorry, uh, energy markets, both in terms of prices, in terms of uh, developments, in terms of uh, expectations uh, in, in the next uh, few years, let alone in, in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, there are a lot of, of, uh, um, of 
ideas that are put forward, uh, which are interesting, but then uh, they're not there yet in terms of implementation. And it is difficult to, when it comes to deciding on investment, uh, if there is a boiler that is coming to the end of its lifetime and needs to be replaced, well, that needs to be replaced um, to the best knowledge of the uh, operator. You cannot say, please wait five years because there is a new generation of boiler coming up. Uh, no, that doesn't work because then the, the, the site is closed. So um, uh, we need to work with uh, on, uh, on uh, two layers, I would say, uh, especially in, in sectors like ours where uh, our uh, um, uh, emissions come from combustion of fuels. One is to, to try to make sure that whatever we do today, uh, it is uh, in a way uh, compatible with whatever is coming up next. Again, to the best of our knowledge. And, and secondly, is to try to work out um, uh, how to make sure that whoever is investing today, even if it's not uh, uh, perfectly tailored, at least we, we have a way of, of bringing them back afterwards. While the new ones, the new investments, then they will uh, certainly be coming up uh, with uh, new information, new developments. Uh, but I think it's key that we have uh, clear signals today, because if we just wait for something to happen in the future, well, I'm afraid that that is not good enough from industry, uh, in this industrial point of view in, in terms of, of uh, giving the confidence in going through in terms of uh, investment decisions. Nicola, I, I wonder whether I could ask you whether you think you're talking about needing that sort of uh, that guidance. May I ask whether the, the guidance, if it is maybe in the form of regulation, uh, should be more of a nudge or maybe more of a shove, if I can put it that way, if we're talking about industry. And, I, and I'll, I'll do the same question for consumers as well. But first of all, Nicola, for industry, um, a nudge or a shove in the right direction? Well, I think nudge is not enough uh, nowadays. I think we, we've, we've been going through nudging for quite some time. Uh, now it's really a matter of, of uh, taking bold decisions. Um, in the previous panels we were discussing, for instance, about uh, blending. Well, what does it mean blending? Is it 1%, is 10%, is 15%, is 20%? When, how, uh, how it's going to happen, uh, by which timing? Because uh, uh, if we don't have that information, uh, then, uh, yeah, um, discussions will not help. Okay, Nicola, thank you. Um, Paul, let me come to you now on this one because your, your heat pump has got an awful lot of, a lot of uh, conversation around it. Little did you know. Um, you obviously have an awful lot of knowledge about the industry. This is your industry. This is what you, you work within. Uh, you're a consumer who obviously does your own um, research, uh, an educated consumer. And yet you still didn't decide to go for the heat pump. Now, leaving the finances aside and the reasons that you gave, what would it have been if we could use you as a typical consumer? Um, what would it have been that after everything that I've just said would, would have made you go for that heat pump? Well, I, I just think the, 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 the whole system's not really set up properly, you know. 20 years ago or 35 years ago, or I don't know when these people put put in, put in a gas boiler in this house uh, for the last time. Um, it was the right thing to do. And the system was set up in a way that told them to do that. I'm sure it incentivized it in one way or the other, or, or it was just a natural default option. Um, in 2020, you know, if we, if we, if we take the, 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 the climate challenge as seriously as I think we should, it's, it's not the right thing to do. Um, it doesn't make sense to be installing a fossil fuel boiler in the basement of a house when you're renovating it. I feel like I live with a market failure now. But, you know, it's it's not that the incentives are slightly misjudged or, or, or not quite correctly calibrated. You know, they're way, way, way off everything about this. So it wasn't even close. I mean, and it did come down entirely to, to money in the end. I, I mean, I didn't even think about it, not, not for more than about five minutes. And I care deeply about these things. You, know, you, you cannot put the burden of dealing with the energy transition on the, individual, on the individual consumer. You know, I'm an educated, middle-class, energy-conscious person, and I said no. So, it, you know, if, if you'll forgive the phrase, which I think you use first, normal people, you know, they're gonna be that much less interested. It, 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 it doesn't, it, it just doesn't work for them. So I agree with what Andreas said, and I agree with what uh, uh, Clara said in the last panel. It comes down to regulatory 
frameworks and incentives. You can ban things, you can incentivize things, you can set up tax codes in such a way that they move the market one way or the other. The fact is, in heat today, in many countries, there is nothing to tell the individual consumer, stop burning oil or gas or I'll leave coal out of it because I think that's increasingly marginal, but there's nothing to tell people, stop burning oil and gas to, to keep your house warm. And until you do that, you know, you can make all the pamphlets and brochures you like, but you know, people within with you know more, more or less think with their with their wallets still, and that's not unreasonable. Um so and, until you set things up in such a way that it makes decent sense for people to opt for a greener option, they they just won't. And you can start with a with a with a tax situation. You know, it's 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 really tough. Gas in Belgium is extremely cheap, and that's that's the way it is right now. And if you don't change that, you could decide not to change that because you don't want to bother the consumer. But if you don't do something about this, people simply won't change. I I, I don't think. What about um, sort of uh, financial incentives as to where you get your gas from and what type of gas? Um, to actually put that in at the very, very beginning. I think someone mentioned it earlier, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you go and fill up your car, um, you'll get a choice or, you know, you go and actually sign up with a, a new provider. Actually, the choice needs to be there then. Yeah, maybe. I mean, and, 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 and that's great, I guess, if it works. As I, as I said earlier, I mean, my first problem with that is I do think no, I, I like the, the, the notion of green gas, whether it's hydrogen or biomethane or, or whatever. I mean, there's there's lots to be excited about there. But I'm a, I'm a little bit dubious about the idea of burning it for such a low value application. I mean, heat is heat's pretty easy. You, know, it, it, you don't need such a, such a rich, precious, useful fuel, I don't think, to keep people's living rooms warm. The other thing I would say is I do think there's a bit of a danger that it becomes an excuse to kind of kick the can down the road. I'll tell you a quick story, if I can have one minute. A couple of years ago, three years ago now, during the negotiations on the Renewable Energy Directive, there was one member state being very difficult, very opposed to the idea of a target for more renewables and heating and cooling. And it got so bad that the commission asked me, an official at the commission asked me if I would have a chat with the people from that member state to understand the nature of their objection. And it was pretty simple in the end. They said, well, the problem is we're not sure how we're going to do this yet. And we may decide to decarbonize heat by switching to hydrogen. But if we do that, we probably won't really start until 2040. And so we're not keen to take on any obligations in the meantime. And that's troubling to me because, I mean, we cannot start with a heat transition in, in, in 2040. Hydrogen is really interesting, but it cannot be an excuse for, for 20 years of inaction. Mm, Paul, thank you very much. Let me bring in Monique on this one. Um, you know, Paul, very clearly says for him it was a financial cost so he he didn't decide to go down that route and i know we're talking about a heat pump but to be fair it could be anything it could be any change of of big infrastructure and for industry as well so you know, given that how do you i didn't want to say push but maybe you would say push but put consumers in in the right direction um but also making sure that their wallets are not overly hit. You know, Paul's very clearly said it was the cost that stopped him doing it. So how do we ensure that consumers get the right deal um, as far as the environment goes, that actually I think we, we all agree consumers want, but actually the right deal financially as well? I mean, how would you set that up? This is really exciting. Uh, I mean, um... I think um, consumers are not really excited about energy decisions. They actually don't need to do it. So, uh, I mean, giving them the choice between green or blue, hydrogen, I mean, uh, well, I mean, it, it comes down to financial decisions. I totally agree. And I also, because you mentioned um, uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the introduction to this round of questions, maybe education. I don't think that you're going to educate consumers in decision making. You need to make it attract. I mean, you need really a mix of push, I mean, regulatory push, and price signals and support. And uh, without that, it won't happen. And for example, what people need is a stable regulatory framework. Uh, those of you who live in Belgium, it's a nightmare to be a solar panel uh, consumer uh, because the prosumer tariff is being, is being discussed since ages with ups and downs. This is not the type of thing that will uh, help people make a decision that is a little bit blunt when it comes to the future. 
So a stable regulatory uh, uh, environment is needed with, with you know, anticip anticipation possible. You need the price signals and carbon pricing is one of the elements, huh? the true cost of energy. As long as you provide this carbon pricing system in a way that it's not going to hit the ones who cannot afford alternative solutions. Huh? So you need to have a distributional impact assessment there. I think that you need to go with financial support. And uh, I will make Paul jealous now because I'm the proud uh, owner of uh, solar panels and my return on investment is four and a half years. Why? Uh, because we went through a collective purchasing system where we could really put pressure on the providers. And so it was like hundreds of consumers who got together. So this is the type of system that you can put in place to help people put, make a collective action out of it, negotiate a good price, negotiate a good installer, and then you really have, uh, uh, the, let's say, the, the bargaining power to make this a, a, a good deal for the people. Um, Hi, Monique, thank you very you much. Want, uh, you. I should finish and then maybe uh, Paul wants to say something. And then you have access to credit. You can give green finance a chance so that people who have you, you may, most households cannot afford that just out of their savings account so make green so green credit accessible to people zero zero interest rate or use the renovation ways to uh, or very very you know progressive credit uh, solutions so that people can can make that investment that is upfront uh, Nobody has the appetite to do that, and low-income consumers don't have the appetite at all to do that. And give energy, proactive energy advice, make it available, and, uh, give it, um, make it available close to where the people live, so that it's not too complicated to just go to a shop or have it online if you need to to see what can happen uh, if I make a decision. So it really, you have to create an environment where people feel safe in making such blunt decisions and to adapt their energy consumption and the, the I mean the, the, the devices and the, the, the solutions that they were, were, are going to adopt. I mean, you, you use the word safe. I, I would probably also use the word they have to be confident as well, which uh, is for consumers and for industry as well. Ladies and gentlemen, we are actually out of time, but if I may just very, very quickly. Um, oh, Paul has another family member with him. Welcome. Maybe we should talk about the future. And um, what actually is important for the future, seeing as we have a, a younger member just joined us. Um, let me get a, a quick one phrase, if I may, from all four of you uh, about what you would like this time next year to know had been accomplished. So if we're talking about getting a good deal for consumers or for industry, for whatever it is on that green deal. So this time next year, so the very beginning of October 2021, and for many reasons, we can all hope it'll be a very different situation that we are talking in. Um, but what would you like to see either for consumers or industry this time next year. Andres, let me start with you and just, just a phrase that you'd like to have seen accomplished by next year. I would like us to have a real conversation um, among all of the sectoral representatives that will be needed to achieve minus 55% and a broad public debate around uh, what policies we want to implement to deliver on this so that because it really is a scale of ambition where we need a broad public debate to get, okay. I think, the, 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 the backing of, of people to, to take it forward. Okay, a broad public debate and sooner rather than later, I can understand you saying. Uh, Nicola, let me come to you next. Um, this time next year, what would you like to have accomplished? Yeah, uh, two things. Um, by this time of the year, we would have uh, uh, new state aid guidelines who will uh, help us uh, uh, speeding up investments as of uh, uh, well, uh, January 2022, as the, the new uh, guidelines will apply there. And uh, um, uh, a real uh, agreement uh, unlocking the EU recovery fund, so we can use um, that fund in, com in combination with state aid uh, revised rules to speed up investments in Europe. OK, thank you very much. Um, Monique, let me come to you this time next year. What will you like to have uh, seen or accomplished? I would like uh, a political decision to have been taken. Uh, so to allocate part of the renovation wave to uh, investment in energy efficiency of uh, residential housing with a priority to those uh, buildings 
maybe social housing where you have less affluent households uh, occupying them. Uh, Monique, thank you very much. And Paul, I'll come to you for the final word on this one. We're talking about the future. You have the future. Uh, standing right beside you. It's been the joy of everyone working from home that we get an insight into some areas that we wouldn't normally. So uh, this time next year, what would you like to see maybe that further step along the road? My daughter says that she's she's keen to see progress towards uh, an energy taxation uh, no, framework that, uh, <laughs> that, 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 that wasn't designed 20 years ago and that is fit for, for the challenges of the next 20, 30 years and not the last ones. Is that it? Well, goodness me, you have her school very well. <laughs> I think it might, might, might be somebody needs some time with, with their dad. Um, thank you so much for everyone joining us for uh, what's been a really interesting panel discussion. Uh, Nicola, uh, Andres, Monique and Paul, thank you very much for your time and thank you for being part of uh, the 30 year celebration of Eurogas as well. Um, let's hope this time next year, actually, we are all talking in a very different situation. Um, let me hand back now to James Watson from Eurogas to uh, give us some final thoughts and some closing opinions from uh, the day's events. James. I'm going to follow that, to be honest, uh, Sasha. I think that, that Paul, Paul and his daughter have stolen the show. But no, it's been brilliant. And I'll start by saying thanks to you, Sasha. Really, you've taken us through those two debates exceptionally well. It's a great pleasure to have you back again this year. Uh, we'll look forward to welcoming you back next year, and I hope we can do it in person. But really, very, very grateful for the way that you've managed all of our experts, all of the different opinions. And really, I think we've come to some really good outcomes. And I think I'll just focus on that a little bit uh, now, just to say, there's been three hours, three hours of an online conference. We've heard a lot of different points of view, but there has been a lot of convergence. I would start by saying the commissioner gave very positive points of view about how she sees the change in the way that the gas sector is approaching uh, the climate challenge. She's welcoming the ambition that we're showing to be part of that solution and finding the right pathway to 2050. Indeed, the MEPs, Maria, first of all, po pointed out some of the values that gas has, the technologies that we'll need. She talked about carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, the need to blend into existing infrastructure to bring those technologies forward. Vila put the challenge on us, told us we have to embrace renewable gas if we want to have a, a proper, credible way to go forward, and that we really need to make sure that we are absolutely going to be seriously credible in delivering uh, the objectives of the climate neutrality that we have. And then we had Christoph, of course, who was telling us that you, know, you can't have one uh, silver bullet, that we need a mixture of everything, and that mixture together uh, will make us be able uh, to achieve our objectives in the most uh, cost-effective way. And so I think that between the keynote speakers, we had a very good uh, approach to all of the different challenges that are facing the gas sector today and how we need to actually embrace them. Moving into the first panel, uh, I thought it was really interesting to see what we heard from people like Giles and, and Jan, who were talking about this isn't a conflict, this is cooperation. We want cooperation. Uh, Wind Europe have been tweeting they want cooperation with Eurogas. This is good. These are the types of things that we want to see. Uh, we don't believe that one sector or one vector alone can actually manage all of the challenges that are facing us in the next 30 years because the challenge is very, very large. And uh, nobody should underestimate that. And it's not a simple, we just need to do this or that and we get the end result. It will require fundamental changes the way that we behave. I think you can say that uh, you know, we had Clara as well bringing in the points about markets that Jan also brought up and saying that we need to make sure that we still keep the market going so we shouldn't go too far from the market principles uh, that have got us to where we are today. Uh, but in principle, we do need to make sure that we are building the right regulatory framework. And it was interesting that Frauke also brought in the idea that indeed she also doesn't see necessarily gas as a full uh, competitor, that in fact the storage of, uh, that gas provides is a very good complement to the system that she has in her mind as a vision for 2050. The second panel, I think I'll summarize very simply, you can't put all this on the consumer and you can't put all this onto industry. And I think that Andreas had some of the ideas about this because he started talking about the regulatory frameworks. And I think that I would end it from a Eurogas point of view by saying, we agree this isn't something that can be all put onto the end user. That's why we believe that the framework should be set up with targets. You can have a carbon price and that's one very good tool. But alongside that, if you set targets for uh, renewable and decarbonized gases, we have a view that you should have a greenhouse gas intensity reduction plus a renewable gas target by 2030 and then 2040 and 2050. This is actually how you will really bring on the volumes of the products that you require. And let's be honest, even if we disagree again, going back to Giles and Jan about how much gas or electricity will be in the system, either way, there's going to be a lot 
of, of both that is going to be needed in the future. And we have to make sure that we are, in that way, getting the framework of policy right to make the investments happen so that people uh, like Paul, as the normal person, uh, can actually make a decision that is based on what is the right thing to do at this moment in time for the climate change uh, issue that we face and the challenge that we have to overcome. And indeed, uh, I think as Monique was also bringing in, we have to make sure that the consumers have the right information. And I think there is also probably a large information gap. And we as the industry also have to take that onto our shoulders and help fill that gap. But as I say, regulatory framework will be key. This will also in the end help change consumer behavior. I want to say major thanks to all of the participants today, all of the panelists. They've really been great. They've really given us a lot of insight, a lot of thought, things that we can take away and then we can come back and have another conversation with on another day. Uh, really thanks to all the keynote speakers, uh, really giving us the high level um, uh, context within which to set these two debates. I already said thank you to you, Sasha, but I'll say thank you again. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I must thank all of the Eurogas team. Uh, it's been very difficult under the uh, COVID-19 crisis for us to be able to put together a show that is meaningful and also something that can resonate uh, with people. But I think they've done an excellent job. So I really have to thank the team uh, for all their work done. And of course, the members who also help us with the ideas and the vision that we have for our own sector. And I would say that that's uh, one of the most Im important things that we have been able to develop, getting that vision right uh, for car carbon and climate neutrality and developing targets. So thank you to them. And finally, and last but by no means least, a huge thanks to the team. Uh, the amount of work that goes into these things is quite scary. So I'm really, really grateful to have great people like Katerina, Kathleen, Sarah, Marina, and all of the policy team uh, and everybody in the organization really pulling together to make this uh, show something that we can be proud of. I really hope that you, the participants, have enjoyed this. If you've got any questions that haven't been answered, we'll, we'll surely answer them on LinkedIn in the coming days. We always like to do that so that you can have the, the burning question that you didn't get answered by the panel. At least Eurogas will try to give you an answer. And my final point is to say, please do tune in to our next installments of the Gas Tech Talks for the clean gas technology um, uh, shows that we'll be putting together with companies who are producing those technologies in Europe and those are the technologies we need. And really been a great pleasure to be virtually with you all today. Please keep in touch. Let's keep the dialogue going and let's make sure that we find the right pathway to 2050. Thank you, everyone.